Good evening and welcome uh, to the March 9th meeting of the Finance Committee of the Northampton City Council. My name is uh, Councillor David Murphy. I chair the committee. With me is Councillor Marianne J Labarge, Councillor Jesse Adams, and Councillor Maureen Carney. Uh, so I'm going to call the meeting to order and let you know that we are uh, taking minutes of this meeting and I, we are live on NCTV and so it's also being recorded by NCTV. Um, I'm going to ask Pam to call the roll. Uh, Councillor Murphy? Here. Councillor Adams? Here. Councillor Carney? Present. Councillor Lavarge? Present. And before we start uh, a public hearing on the water rates, which is our main business for tonight, we have the election of a committee vice chair on the agenda. So I would open the floor to nominations. I'll make a nomination for um, Councillor at Large, Jesse Adams. Second. Do I, have a, oh, I do have a second. All right. Uh, are there any other nominations? Move to close nominations. Move to close nominations. Okay. All in favor of Councillor Adams as vice chair, please say aye. 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 Great. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now we need a motion to open a public hearing with regard to an order to establish water and sewer rates for FY 2017. Make a motion to Second. open up a public hearing. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Um, so to start off, we're going to have the mayor make a presentation because I see a lot of new faces here tonight, which is great. So the mayor's going to make a presentation on how we got where we are, and then we'll open it to public comment after the presentation's done. And the present, if everybody can see the screens, the presentation uh, is uh, includes a number of PowerPoint slides with information. And there's also a handout. Um, I think the mayor actually has them now so that if you can't see the PowerPoint, you're welcome to take a presentation and also take it home with you. So the mayor has the floor. Good evening, uh, members of the Finance Committee uh, and members of the public. Um, this is a uh, presentation on the proposed FY 2017 uh, water and sewer rates that I have uh, recommended to City Council. Um, Pam, if you could go to the first slide. So just to quickly give you a, a history of how we got here, um, as you may know, um, in November of 2014, uh, following the reorganization of city government, uh, the rate setting authority was transferred uh, from the former Board of Public Works to the mayor and city council uh, per the, my administrative order. Uh, in March of 2015, we held a public hearing on potential FY 2016 rates. Um, we received a lot of excellent uh, feedback on the rates, lots of great questions about the rate structure, the history of the rates, um, questions about whether there could be uh, programs for low-income people, for um, uh, providing rate relief. Um, and so in April of 2015, I recommended to the council that we freeze the 2016 rates at the FY 2015 levels um, to allow us additional time for actually two things. Um, obviously, as I mentioned before, to do significant research on alternative rate structures, uh, looking at conservation incentives, looking at low income rate relief, et cetera. The other big item that was happening, because one of the things that we were discussing during that hearing was a series of um, significant uh, capital investments that we needed to make in both the water and sewer systems. Um, we were, f the DPW was in the process of finalizing and scheduling public forums on these two um, significant studies, a comprehensive wastewater management plan and a water supply uh, system assessment management plan, which are sort of long, multi-year uh, uh, studies of both of these important infrastructure systems, um, helping us identify what are the, uh, what are the short, near, and long-term needs of these systems. Um, so uh, the goal was to try to complete um, both of those things, which we have done. Next slide, please. So we did, in fact, uh, commission a water and sewer rate study. We contracted with um, two uh, well-known and well-experienced companies working in tandem, Raftelis Financial Consultants and Woodcock and & Associates, um, to do an in-depth analysis of our current uh, water and sewer rates. Um, and we wanted them to not only uh, look at the appropriateness of our current rate structures in comparison to some of our objectives for the rates, but also look at these uh, large capital projects and help us develop a forecast of what those rates um, would need to be able to generate, uh, rates and fees would need to be able to generate uh, to help us meet both the operating and capital needs of the <coughs> system. So we were not only looking at the structure, but we were looking at the long-term financial forecast of the system. Next slide, please. 
Uh, we set some, some objectives, four main objectives in trying to uh, look at the rate structure. Uh, one was to look at the issue of conservation, uh, promoting conservation. We wanted to figure a way to promote assistance to economically disadvantaged customers. We wanted to look at ways to improve equity among the various customer types. And of course, looking at these long-term projects, we wanted to be able to enhance revenue stability, have a stable uh, revenue source. So those were the main objectives going into that study. Next slide. So I'm now going to turn it over to uh, Jim Lorela, our city engineer and the acting DPW director, to talk about some of those capital needs that went into that financial forecasting, as well as the financial forecasting itself. So I'll turn it over to uh, Jim. Sure. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Jim Lorela with the Public Works Department, as the mayor ind indicated. Um, so one of the first things that we did with a rate study consultant is um, we took a lot of the information for key water capital projects that were identified in the water asset management plan. And we provided that information to the consultant to, to put within a financial plan that I'll talk about in a minute. So under some of the important water capital projects that we've identified, between FY17 and FY21, there's about $4 million in water line replacement projects that are scheduled. Some of the projects are listed there on Cons, North Farms, North Maple, and Day Avenue. Um, Hinkley Street and Damon Road are other projects that were slated to be done under the water line replacement program. A little bit further out in 2021, we have Reservoir Dam Repairs, um, which is a large project that's coming up to complete important repairs to the Ryan Reservoir and the West Whateley Reservoir, which are two of the city, two of this city's three main water supply reservoirs. Um, the Ryan Reservoir is about 720 million gallons, and the dam uh, is about an 80-foot high dam, 940 feet long with a concrete spillway. It's up in Waitley and uh, has a number of um, things that need to be done to repair that. So those, that project slated um, in 2021. In the next slide, you'll see um, key sewer capital needs. These are projects that were identified during the comprehensive wastewater management planning process that we're um, in the process of concluding. Uh, at the top, you'll see from FY17 to FY21, uh, again, we have sewer line replacement projects and sewer system studies, about $2.5 million um, that are budgeted for those, including sewer line replacements for Day Avenue and Hinkley Street are projects that are coming up. And then other projects that are still um, being identified by the department using the, uh, using the report. And the, the biggest capital need on the sewer side and, and the water side really is um, upgrades that are necessary to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, and those are scheduled between FY17 and uh, FY21, close to $30 million worth of improvements during those few years. Um, many basic treatment processes at the plant are really beyond um, their design life, and they need to be replaced so that we'll be able to meet our Clean Water Act discharge permit requirements to protect the safety of the water in the Connecticut River. Um, the plant's very old. Um, some of the treatment plant dates back to the 1950s. Um, the majority of the plant equipment dates to the 1970s, so clearly a situation where um, upgrades need to be done simply to replace equipment that's um, necessary to meet our discharge permit. So if you were to take those capital projects and put them on a bar graph, it would look something like this. Um, the darker blue is the sewer system needs, and you can see that some of the larger spikes there um, in the time frame shown on this graph are related to capital projects that I, I just identified mainly at the, at the wastewater treatment plant. The, the uh, lighter blue projects are the ones uh, slated for the water system, with the 2020 number being uh, the year that the dam uh, projects would be done. So you can see as you go over time, the capital needs vary um, significantly from year to year. So what, what we needed to do is we go to the next slide is we worked with the rate consultant to determine a water financial plan in terms of the best way to finance the capital projects for, for the water system using enterprise fund money. So the financial plan accounts for different elements that, that are shown in this graph. Um, the blue, the dark blue is the operating expenses or normal operating expenses to run a water system. The lighter blue is existing debt service. The majority of that would be related to the construction of the water treatment plant and that goes out a number of years. Um, and then the green is proposed debt service, and that comes out about five years from now when the repairs to the dam will be done. So 
So it gives you a, a sort of sense of what those things are. And then the, the yellow um, indicates cash reserves that are used to fund some of the projects that come up. So it's really a balancing and a smoothing out of the, the overall financial needs for the water system. Um, and that, that's sort of the average line that's shown going across the years. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see we did something similar for the sewer financial plan. So the same elements, um, except you'll see that um, there's a lot of additional proposed debt service, which is the green. So unlike the water system, because of all the needs at the wastewater treatment plant, um, bonds will be used to pay for a lot of the improvements that are made at the plant. So the debt service increases over time um, to pay for those uh, large projects at the wastewater plant. So um, these were the financial plans that we uh, developed with assistance of the consultant and working with the city's finance director. So on the, the next slide, the mayor will take over and talk about the rate structure. So um, thank you very much, uh, Jim. So the current rate, uh, water rate structure, as you may know, um, all customers are charged the same volumetric rate. Uh, regardless of the type, the size, or the amount of water used. Um, there's also a very f small fixed charge, uh, which is assessed per bill, uh, which recovers very little of the water system's fixed costs. We also do not have any private fire protection charges, which is, um, which is something that is found in, in many other cities. The FY 2016 flat water rate is $5.58 per CCF. You're going to see that term CCF throughout the presentation. That stands for, it's basically 100 cubic feet, centum cubic feet. Um, but that is actually the measure that's used um, in the, in the uh, water industry and in municipal water primarily. Um, so that's where that uh, CCF number that you'll start to see later in the presentation. We can go to the next slide. The sewer rate structure, all customers are charged for sewer services based on 100% of metered consumption, um, except for a small number of large industrial customers. We have five large industrial customers that have specialized uh, manufacturing processes and they have a specialized meter to capture uh, what they're actually sending into the, uh, into the wastewater stream. Um, and they pay for 100% of based on that meter. But all customers right now, you get your water bill, you have a consumption rate, um, and that rate of consumption, 100% is multiplied by the sewer rate to come up with what your sewer bill is. Um, and that consumption rate right now is $6.08 per CCF of metered water consumption. Um, we heard a little bit about that during the public hearings. In addition to hearing about the, the flat rate on the water side, we did hear from folks who talked about um, the fact that not not all 100% of our water goes into the waste stream, that, that there's uh, water that's used for other purposes that don't actually uh, go into the wastewater stream. Um, so if we go to the next slide. So the key recommendations that, we, that are embedded in this proposed rate structure, um, again, uh, provide economic assistance to customers who qualify based on current tax exemption criteria. We wanted to create a two-tiered water rate structure for uh, small meters. Uh, we wanted to implement a larger fixed charge. That's, uh, again, referenced earlier, a charge that would help us c capture more of the fixed costs of operating the system, not just because regardless of whether you turn on your water or don't turn on your water, we still need to maintain the infrastructure and we need to, there's all the fixed costs that go into running that. We also wanted to create a new private fire protection charge, uh, which I can talk about later. And we are recommending that we shift from that 100% uh, rate of water consumption <laughs> to an 80% rate of metered water consumption. Again, out of recognition of the fact that not all customers are using 100% uh, of the water that comes out of their uh, faucets are going into uh, sewers or drains. So those are the recommendations from which we use to correct, to, to, um, to create the rates that I'm putting forward. Next slide. So these are the water and sewer rates that we've put forward to you in the council order. These are the volumetric rates. And you'll see that on the water rates up above, we have created two categories, customers with a one, eight, one inch meter or smaller, um, and then customers with a meter larger than one inch. Within those two customer classes, uh, on the smaller uh, sized uh, meters, 
um, there's actually a tier one consumption rate and a tier two consumption rate. Uh, that the zero to 16 CCF, uh, the customer in that smaller category will pay $4.73 uh, per CCF. So that's for the first 16 CCF that that customer uses. Anything over 16 CCF is charged at the rate of $6.21 per CCF. Now, moving to the customers with meters larger than one inch, there is a flat uh, consumption rate of $6.09 uh, per CCF, which um, some pointed out in the last hearing, and it's correct, you'll note that that number is actually lower than the higher um, than the higher tier two rate uh, of the smaller customer. And we'll talk about some of the effects of that later in the presentation. On the sewer rate side, we're recommending uh, $7.52 per CCF based on 80% of metered water consumption. So again, you'll take that, you'll take whatever your water usage is and multiply um, by 80% uh, before calculating against the sewer rate to come up with what your sewer uh, charge would be. Um, and for most customers, we are non-metered. Um, for the metered customers, it's it's strictly based on that meter times seven dollars and fifty-two cents. Next slide. Now I wanted to talk about that 16 CCF conservation rate because I know there were some questions about that at the last meeting. Why do we use that as a conservation rate? Where did we get that number? Why don't we use a different number? And this is actually derived from, uh, from, the, from the DEP and from um, national standards about water consumption. So just to take you through the math, and you can kind of follow along, uh, the D DEP recommends recommended goal of daily individual consumption. That means each one of us in our daily lives is 65 gallons uh, per person per day. So if you then take that 65 gallons per person per day and you multiply it by the average household size, uh, so the average household size is actually 2.07 uh, persons per household, you come up with 134.6 gallons per day for an average household. Uh, we then take that and convert it to the CCF, uh, which is dividing it by 7.48 gallons, which is equivalent to one cubic feet, and that's where we come up with the um, uh, uh, 18 uh, cubic feet. Um, we then take that and multiply it by uh, uh, the 90 days and a quarter, because uh, that's per day, so you multiply it by 90 days per quarter, um, and that gives you a number of 1,620 cubic feet per quarter. Um, we, then, uh, we then take that and we divide it um, by 100 to get to CCFs, and so that's where we get to the 16 CCFs per quarter. So when we set that and when we worked with the consultants to arrive at that and trying to think about what is a reasonable uh, target that smaller customers should use, we wanted to go with what was sort of an accepted uh, standard that's put forth by, by our you know, environmental uh, regulator. So that's where the 16 CCF comes from. There's a little graphic on that slide you may or not be able to see. It just shows you that you know, 100 cubic uh, uh, feet um, or one CCF e uh, equals uh, 748 gallons of water, and then it sort of gives you some ideas about how much gallons, uh, how many gallons of water people use for various um, household activities. So that's where we get the 16 CCF conservation rate from. If you go to the next slide. So in addition to the volumetric rates, which we're putting forward, um, we are also uh, making uh, the DPW is, with my approval, will be updating the uh, fixed charges that we currently uh, charge per quarter based on meter size. Uh, this again was one of the things that the consultant mentioned, um, that currently the, the uh, fixed charges are, are, uh, are so low that they really, they derive a very small portion of the overall revenue. Currently, the current F uh, the charges that are in place right now derive about 0.54% of the overall revenue. Um, we're recommending making slight increases up to those um, to bring that up to about 2%. Um, still not significant, but it's still, it's definitely, um, it, it's a recognition that there are these fixed costs of operating the system that are, that, that we have to incur regardless of the um, consumption one way or the other. This is actually the component of the program with which we want to insert the affordability program uh, on this fixed fee side. 
Um, and so, as, it's, as you see on the slide, uh, for customers in the city who currently qualify for a low-income exemption on either their real estate taxes or uh, the Community Preservation Act, um, they will automatically be exempted from this fixed charge on their utility bill. So this will not only lower th those customers' bill, but it also removes the only portion of the bill uh, that, the con that the customer doesn't control through water usage. Um, and this is actually, uh, when we looked around, this is actually somewhat common in utilities in general. This is sort of, the, this is all also the system that electric companies use if you qualify for a low income rate uh, they typically exempt you from the fixed charge side of electric uh, usage so um, so this is both the fixed charges and also talking about the affordability program that we're trying to build in next slide so uh, people just may not have a sense of the customer breakdown we added these slides after the last meeting to kind of show people uh, the distinction between uh, the universe of customers who are one inch or smaller uh, or uh, meters uh, customers that have a meter larger than one percent you can see it graphically illustrated here um, 95 percent of the customers in the system are one inch meter or smaller uh, five percent are larger than one percent um, and, uh, and, and as you'll see later, it doesn't really, it doesn't, it does not break down along commercial residential lines like we sometimes talk about in taxes because there can be, um, there can be large facilities that don't use a lot of water that have a small uh, meter sized uh, serving their, their facility. Um, so it's not really a, um, it's not really uh, tied to that. It's really just about the, 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 the uh, size of the infrastructure serving the customers. If you go to a next slide, we have a further breakdown, which breaks it down into its component parts, um, you know, from 5 eighths to 3 quarters to 8, um, eight all the way up to 8 inch uh, lines. And you can see those numbers get even smaller. Uh, but that just kind of gives you a breakdown uh, that we didn't provide in the previous presentation. But I think it's at least helpful to give you a sense of the magnitude of, uh, of the customer base. Next slide, please. So the other, uh, the other program that we are going to implement, again, um, this is a, uh, a fixed charge, and it's a charge that recognizes that there, are, there is special infrastructure uh, required to a select group of customers um, to provide, um, it says fire protection, but basically it's a fire line. It's a separate fire line. Uh, it's an unmetered separate fire line uh, to a facility that may have a uh, fire suppression system. Um, and again, we looked around at other communities, and this is a <coughs> charge that is, uh, that is quite common in other communities. And you can see the charges begin at the two inch or larger, um, and it's a $10 per quarter charge, um, and all the way up to the 10 inch line. Um, uh, so that shows you what the fire protection charge would be. Again, these are charges that we are going to be implementing um, at an administrative level. Uh, these are not part of what's being recommended as part of the volumetric rates. But I'm trying to show all of it so you can see the whole universe of the rate structure. Again, another effort to, um, to not have our rates totally reliant on volumetric consumption rates, but to also have some fixed charges uh, to acknowledge the fixed costs of running the system. Next slide. So what we've done is taken some uh, the impacts of a water bill, uh, looking at a quarterly bill. And these are just generic slides that show customer impacts of water. Um, and so you start at the left-hand column, uh, and that gives you the CCF usage, all the way from 3 uh, CCF um, all the way up to 2,000 CCF. Um, and then we've got various meter sizes on there, because the meters, depending on your meter size, there's a, there's a different uh, fixed charge. Um, but if you take, we, we, we highlighted the yellow one, because that's really a, a sort of an average um, uh, uh, customer usage number, 12 CCF. Um, it's approximately 9,000 gallons per quarter. Um, we looked at that, and so if you, if you walk, if you go across the slide, you'll see a 12 uh, CCF customer with a 5 8 inch um, meter, which again is by far the most common size meter in the city. Um, the FY16 charge for just water would be $67.96 per quarter. Um, under in FY27, with both the rate change and the fixed fee change, um, it's $69.40. 
So that change is $1.44 per quarter uh, for that particular hypothetical customer. And you can then see if you move over um, with the income discount, so if you take away the fixed charge, if it's for a customer who qualifies for the income dis discount, they'll actually be paying less in 2017 than they paid in 2016. It's an $11.20 per quarter uh, savings on their quarterly bill. Um, so you can see that the, the, how the income discount would play out in a scenario like that. Um, we, we, we don't carry the income discount much above um, the one inch meters um, because then we start to get into the much larger. Uh, there could be folks who are with one inch or larger that, uh, that, uh, that would qualify. I don't know, but we were just trying to show typical residential uh, use. So that's the water impact. If we go to the next slide, we'll show you the sewer impact. Um, same scenario where we've taken, you know, the sort of the hypothetical CCF usage. Um, the next column is then you have to do the math to go to 80% of that CCF, 80% of your water consumption um, to arrive at the number that'll be used to calculate the sewer rate. Um, and then it shows the, the meter size, but that's just because it, 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 it carries back to the, um, to the CCF, how the CCF was derived. So for, again, for that, for that um, typical residential customer uh, with a 12 CCF consumption, 5 8 inch meter, um, their sewer bill would be this year $72.96 per quarter. Um, in FY 2017, it would be $72.19, so it, it goes down 77 cents uh, per quarter. You're seeing the impact of the, you know, the rate is going up, but then you're also switching to the 80% calculation. So it actually creates, in most cases, a reduction on the sewer side um, for, um, for most customers. So that's sewer. Uh, we did, uh, this is the combined, so now this takes both of those two charts, melds them together, and looks at the overall water and sewer, um, overall water and sewer uh, quarterly bill comparison. I'll use the one in yellow, but you've got all the other scenarios. Uh, you know, again, a 12 uh, CCF uh, consuming customer with a 5 8 inch meter. Um, their combined would be uh, 140.92 per quarter. Um, in FY uh, 2017, that would actually go up to $141.59, or a $0.67 cent per quarter uh, change. Um, and the um, income discount, which would then eliminate um, uh, the fixed charge for water, would actually then lower it to $128.95. Um, which is again a savings of $11.97 um, per quarter for that particular customer class. So, um, so that shows you what the combined uh, water and sewer impact would be um, in those hypotheticals. So I know we got a lot of comments last time about uh, specifically concerned about uh, business customers. And we were wondering how this plays out for various, because there was a sense I think that just universally this was going to have a, a, a negative impact on business customers. So what we tried to do is we tried to select kind of a cross-section of well-known, well-recognized local businesses in Northampton and Florence, um, and we ran these same scenarios. And what we did is, uh, be, because we didn't want to go through three separate slides, we did a combined water and sewer. So basically it's this last slide where we take the combined water and sewer and then we actually apply it. We looked back at, um, at a total year's consumption, actually FY15 consumption, and we came up with an average uh, per quarter consumption for these customers. These are public records, so I'm not disclosing any um, information that's not a public record. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see um, what we've come up with. So we, p we took, I'll just run through them quickly, Cooper's Corner, uh, the Faces TD Bank Building, they're on the same meter together, so we can't separate them out. Uh, the new Fairfield Inn, uh, the Florence Barbershop, the Florence Hardware, Florence Pizza, Joe's Cafe, Main Street Cleaners, the Northampton Brewery, Paradise Copies, Spoleto, Stop and Shop, Sylvester's and Thorns. And we ran them through and you can see the various meter size, uh, me meter sizes for all of them. And then you can see um, Cooper's Corner, um, which uh, I assume folks at home know is, uh, uh, you know, Rich Cooper's uh, grocery uh, slash liquor store slash deli um, in, in the heart of Florence. 
um, they, they would see an increase uh, quarterly of $44.36 applying this uh, standard to it. And then you can kind of go down the line, uh, the, the FACES TD Bank building, uh, $120.60 per quarter. Um, all the way down, you know, Joe's Cafe, $71.96 per quarter um, change in their bill. Um, the, thing to, the thing also to think about, and I, I should have mentioned this in the earlier slides, um, is that uh, what you don't see happening, because, what, because in the past you would have a fixed volumetric rate, which represented 99.6% of the revenue of the system. So if you are going to do a 2% increase in water rates, it would basically fall completely on that volumetric rate. You'd basically raise the volumetric rate by to, to generate 2% of revenue. Um, and, uh, and on the, on the um, sewer side, uh, our goal is to generate about 3% revenue, again, to, to, to match the model. But that doesn't play out that way when you run these scenarios because of the mixed rates and the different tiered um, rate systems. So um, the other thing I wanted to talk about, because I think it's, and I, I actually did this before I came because I thought it was interesting. Um, in addition to looking at these impacts and seeing what they are, people, ha um, this came up at the last hearing, the tiered rates people uh, got, um, I think, a little bit hung up on because you see the tier one rates, mm -hmm. you know, which are $4.73 for the first 16 CCF, and then you uh, get to the tier two consumption, uh, which is $6.21 per CCF. But then when you move up into the 5% the larger meter class, it's actually that lower number of $6.09 per CCF. So I just, I, and um, when you think about it, um, well, so what I did, just because I'm not, a, I'm a visual person, I need to kind of play with things. I actually took my water, my water bill, my water characteristics of my bill. I have a 5 8 inch meter. Um, and I looked at, and I basically put uh, the Northampton Brewery's water consumption. So if I consumed as much water as the Northampton Brewery consumed in a quarter, um, my quarterly water charge as a residential homeowner would be $3,180.68 per quarter. If you run that through, um, uh, the breweries uh, metrics, they have a one and a half you know, inch meter and they're paying the different rate. And now I'm only looking at the water consumption here. I'm not looking at the fixed rates or any of the other stuff, just the water rate. That quarterly charge is actually lower. It's $3,142.44. Um, so it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, eventually when you get out far enough, that 16 CCF, you lose that 16 CCF savings at the higher level. So um, I think there's a concern that uh, we were um, trying to shift too much toward business, but if you actually take that lower flat rate in the, in the large class and run it out and run scenarios against, um, if a residential customer use that water being charged the smaller customer rates, they would actually pay more. So um, that was just something that I wanted to add to this slide, which I think shows you um, how these different uh, scenarios uh, play out. So if you go to the next slide. So as I mentioned, and this is where I was doing all these scenarios, and I hope people at home will take their quarterly bill uh, because we do have a calculator set up and we've got actually a sample. It's actually my bill. I don't know why they blacked out my name, but that is actually my bill from the last quarter. And there's two numbers circled, and you basically put in the size of your meter, you tell us whether you're on sewer or not, and then you put in the cubic feet usage uh, that's on your bill. It, mine is 2100. And when you put that in, it basically converts it to CCF for you, and then it tells you this is what your fixed charge will be, this is what your water charge will be, this is what your quarterly sewer charge, and this is your total water and sewer charges. So um, you folks at home can take their last quarter bill under the current rates, run this scenario, and they can actually see what the change in rates will, um, you know, will impact in terms of their particular situation. Um, and again, 
this this effort is an effort and i think that's what we're trying to combine in the in the presentation is we have these major capital needs that we need to fund we have this 1970s uh, era wastewater treatment plant that we have to make major upgrades to we have an ongoing need to replace water lines and sewer lines we have the dam repairs up at our two reservoirs that we have to work on so we're trying to figure out a way to create a smooth glide path that isn't going to have these huge herky-jerky rate changes um, and we've also tried to build a rate structure that is sensitive to the different uh, uh, types of customers, the different types of water usage, um, and that recognizes that there are fixed costs in the system um, that currently aren't recognized as a, as a revenue generator um, in the current system. And we want to try to build that into the, to the new system. Finally, uh, let's go to the next slide. At the last uh, meeting, uh, uh, Mr. Laurel mentioned a study that was done in 2012. It was released, uh, it's called Massachusetts Water Infrastructure Toward Financial Stability. It was a 2012 report. Uh, it, uh, it's many pages long, but I just took this little excerpt out of one of the sections. Um, and I just want to read the quote. Um, this was basically a study of water infrastructure it, across Massachusetts, what the state of it is, what the condition of it is, um, how much people are paying, how much people are planning, how much people are investing. So, quote, for a service that has a very high societal value where failures will cause great inconveniences, loss of business, and jeopardize the public health, we often fail to pay enough for the service. Ironically, many of us see the value in high monthly fees for internet or cable service. As a point of comparison, water rates on an annualized basis compare to the following rates paid for other community commonly used utilities, and then it points to this chart on the right. The chart's a little bit dated. It's, it's, it's from Kiplinger's uh, 2009, but they basically looked at average, um, nationally average rates, and then they looked at what those bills represented as a percentage of median household income. Um, so, you know, water and sewer rates on average represent, you know, water 0.52% of median income, sewer 0.75, cell phones between 0.92% and 1.10%, uh, cable TV and internet 1.28%, and then electricity and, uh, you know, all the way up to 1.2%. In, in, a 2010, in 2010, the ITT Corporation conducted a survey of American voters concerning the value of water. 69% of those polled agreed with the statement, I generally take my access to clean water for granted. A full 95% of American voters polled in the same survey value water over any other services they receive, including heat and electricity. Um, I, I men I've mentioned this in conversations I've had to people, and I thought this was sort of an interesting uh, takeaway from that report that really does look at, um, we, we all pay for a lot of utilities in our, in our as part of our life. Uh, you know, again, electric, um, cable TV with all the hundreds and hundreds of channels and pay-per-view. Um, many of us have cell phones or smartphones with uh, monthly service plans, et cetera. Um, uh, and yet, when we talk about having clean water, having uh, working uh, sanitary sewage, um, we sometimes don't think about that in the same terms. So this was interesting to see this called out um, in a report. So that's the last slide of the updated report, and I will, um, and I will uh, either answer questions myself or Mr. Lorla can answer questions, or uh, we can open it up to public comments. All right. Well, I think what we'll do first is committee questions, because we might root out something that would get the public inspired for a question. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Lorla, could you come up and grab two adjoining seats up here? NCTV would have an easier time. If you're answering people, they have an e easier time taking your pictures if you're over here. I'd prefer to stay at the podium if that's well, okay. What if there's a, a member of the public at the podium? I will step away from <laughs> you. <laughs> okay. I'd rather not, I, I don't want to, you know, that's the council's uh, dais. I'll stay over here. Okay, we'll just Respect. hope NCTV is going to push the buttons quickly. So questions, first of all, from the committee. Councilor Labarge. Yes, Mayor. Um, what did it, what was the cost of us hiring that consultant? Because I have been asked about that. Certainly, yes. I think the total, um, we had signed a total contract cost of about 29,000 was the was the maximum contract. I think to date we've, um, about 21,000 is what we've paid. 
um, so far. And I would tell you, um, for those of you who uh, met Mr. Woodcock and Mr. Fox in January, um, I would I would ask you folks the, their video presentation that they did to the council in January and their presentation is on the website um, as well as their credentials and uh, you know after that hearing that we had a year ago um, one of the things I started looking around was looking at other communities that had been doing uh, rate changes and um, and many most of them hired people that are expert in this field who have the who have the ability to be able to kind of take a customer base drill down into it look at three four or five years of customer usage um, and also they understand the full breadth of uh, of different practices around around the um, around the country and I if you recall during their presentation they they mentioned that they had looked at lots of different potential um, you know potential different structures, but this the one that the ones that they recommended to us really seem to fit best with our profile as a as a city. Um. Second. Yes. And I know I had gone to Susan about a year ago, two years ago, and to Joan Serafin. What is the actual procedure, Mayor, to qualify for a low income exemption? I've been told, well, once somebody applies, no matter, it could be two years, four years, then something comes up again, and they use the same form. To me, that is not the right way to go. To me, people's incomes do change. Somebody in the family, there could be an inheritance. Somebody could also retire from another agency and there's more income so how is that actually checked i'm so the, being asked these questions yeah, no it's a it's a fair question so your question is how often do we certify that that a customer who's come in yes. uh, well uh, like a, a tax uh, um, someone who comes into the assessor provides their their income information um, and gets certified that they're eligible for an exemption on their real estate taxes. You're asking how often do they, does that get monitored? Or anything, yeah. like the stormwater utility fee? Yeah, well the stormwater, the stormwater fee, um, I suppose people can come in separately for that, but oftentimes if it's already, in, if they already have the real estate, it automatically applies, but. Um, do you have a. Um, they do have to apply, have to apply, every, apply year. every year. Yes, and they have to show that proof. And the uh, assessors with your, you know, um, income tax and so forth. Like that. Yeah, I mean, I'd ha I mean, this is a. Um, we use a state form. Mm -hmm. There's a state form that they fill out every okay. year, and they're obviously, you know, attesting to this information, and the assessor meets with them privately to uh, to review it and discuss it. Um, so, uh, and it's a sort of a, it's a. It is a private process because they're revealing, you know, very sensitive information. Exactly, but my main yeah. concern was yep. to make sure that because they've done it one time, they mm -hmm. don't use mm -hmm. that same income all okay. the time. No, that's uh, that's definitely that a, it's verified. a valid concern, and and I will uh, bring that back to uh, uh, Joan Serafin. I appreciate that. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, Councilor Adams. Um, so, following up on her question about. The cost of the consultants. There's about about twenty one thousand for both. It's combined. Combined. They were they um, they worked collaboratively on the project. They um, we sought quotes and they worked. Uh, they they sort of as he may have described in the meeting. They've tent. They were once worked separately um, and now they've sort of combined and work uh, together on the project. So that was the total for both of them for the total contract. I saw. Uh, I think it was on Open Checkbook that Raf tell us. A payment to RAF tell us about six thousand two hundred sixteen. Um, were they paid equally, equally what they, approximately what, in the end? What happens is they submit they submitted bills to us at different steps along the process. So we we would meet with them, work on different aspects of the process. We typically don't pay if if we well this was a contract that had a maximum amount, um, and so uh, which we would not exceed. Uh, or you'd have to do a new contract, et cetera. So we uh, typically in a contract situation like that, um, you there's an invoice submitted, um, and then that's uh, uh, that's goes through our financial process, our, and then they're paid. So that's why you'll see, um, you know, a six thousand dollar invoice at some point in the process. If you go back historically, you'll probably see other uh, RAF TELUS payments on the Open Checkbook system. Mm -hmm. yep. um, 
And now you worked with them over the course of a, of a year, approximately? Yeah, I mean, we, we um, uh, last August, I believe, we awarded the contract. I think that's correct, uh, last August. Yes. And, um, and so we, we awarded that to them. We got all that uh, started. Um, and then we um, uh, began meeting with them on a, on a regular basis. Send, we first had to do a massive um, uh, sort of data dump. I mean, they basically um, asked us to provide them all of the, um, all of the relevant data about our customers. Um, do you want to describe that, or, or am I covering it OK? Sure. Or, no. OK. Yeah, you're doing, doing fine. So the project started in August, and it, and it did start with a data dump. We were provided all the information about the capital projects from the capital planning, and then all of our operational expenses and our budgetary information for both water and sewer. So they used that information in the preparation of the financial models that we talked about. Was was the 21000 in the FY16 budget? Uh, it was part of our, it was in our, we used it actually from water and sewer enterprise funds. The two uh, shared the expenses of it because it was something to directly benefit the, uh, it was a project specifically designed for the water and sewer uh, enterprise. They are share, they're both sharing the cost of that. Yeah. Out of but, our, so does that mean it wasn't expressly in the 2016? Out of our, uh, we had a, we have an engineering, we have an engineering and, and design services line item. Uh, in our budget for these kinds of projects when we have, um, you know, uh, when it's, 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 there's a certain amount in there so that if we have to do uh, design and engineering services for, if we have projects that can't be handled by our inside engineers or designers, and so that's the funds that we use for this. Mm -hmm. Any more? Uh, another one, Councilor Adams? Yeah. Um, I'm wondering how the new rate structure would impact um, and change the distribution, the distribution borne by the, the different classes now. So you have residential, commercial, tax exempt, and city of North Anthem, which, which may or may not be actual separate classes. But, but I'm wondering if we can have, um, if, we can, if we can see over the last you know, year or two with our current s structure, if we could see how, though it's it's um, a single rate, how how it's how it's play, how it's been borne out. So how, what what the different categories of user have paid, and if we could have a comparison of what they will pay based on projections um, over the next several years, over the next three to five years, I think that will be helpful to see, because um, obviously the new structure doesn't distinguish between. What types of user only only on, but only on usage? Um, I would it also doesn't distinguish between commercial and residential. Well, that's so that's what I just said. Usage. Yeah, that's that's what I just. No, said. No, I just mean actual um, user type. I mean, you have Cooper's Corner, which has a one-inch meter, so it's in the smaller class under our new scenario. It's not in the larger <laughs> class. Well, and then you have some other anomalies. So it's really not. I, one of the problems with looking at the large with looking at different classes and why you can't have a commercial and residential um, is there's really, you know, on a, on a residential side, it, there's a very common sort of, everybody uses the same amount of, not uses the same amount, but we take showers, we wash our clothes, it's that sort of home use. There's not really a defining characteristic of commercial water use. So there, it's very difficult to, that's why there's, that's why we just use a flat rate on that system. So. Um, we can certainly, if I mean, and in fact, the last slides uh, or the the hypothetical slides does show you what the current rate structure uh, generates in terms of a fee, and then it shows you what it generates under the new fee structure. Um, we can try to, we could certainly run some other uh, scenarios on that um, to show you what that is. Uh, you know, we could certainly do that. Yeah, because you know, I I want to see. What if there's a what shift there will be in burden? Um, I, if even if it's difficult, I, I'm sure, I, I assume it can be done mm -hmm. um, to see if you know what the what the change in burden will be for the business community. And, and I understand that that um, that that I mean I guess it could be difficult because the rate itself doesn't distinguish between what kind of user. Um, but I would like to see that. 
I mean, that's why we ran this scenario. Well, I understand that, but I understand you used individual businesses. Yeah. I understand that, but I'm, but I'm wondering about the entire class, the business community, because because I've said publicly repeatedly that my concern is about the business community. So it's helpful. It's certainly helpful to see those individuals. Absolutely helpful, because that gives us a sense. But I'm wondering what, you know. But if I take an average of the, like if I were to just take that universe and average them all out and say it's going to be an average increase, I don't know how representative that would be. I don't know if that would give you, just because there is such a distinction between the various classes. But, um, and again, our system isn't set up as commercial residential. It's set up by meter size. So that's why we tried to pick, we, we went in looking for specific addresses of places we knew were businesses so that we could call those out. Um, I, can, I can talk with our team and maybe Jim can uh, shed some light on this. Actually, He's an engineer. Yeah, actually the mayor's doing a pretty good job describing it. We actually did look um, with our financial administrator and the public works department about trying to break it down in, in the way that you're asking for, Councilor Adams, and the, the way that our utility billing system is set up, we're not, we're not actually, um, tracking um, usage and things based on a nonprofit or commercial sector or residential. We don't have that type of classification within the current billing system. So there's really no easy way to pull out system wide data that you're looking for. And that's why we went to the sort of the specific um, examples to try to illuminate what the impacts would be on businesses that people are, are familiar with. So across the, the whole system, we can't do it based on the way our utility billing system is set up. Um, so I don't know what to say. So that. you could compare specific businesses like you did here, but as a business class, right? It's hard to do. Universally, we don't have access to that data because things aren't. It's not so voted that way, right? Mm -hmm. um, one more. Well, I can also yeah, add that I I did meet with the um, I did meet with the CFO of Smith College um, and the uh, and their. Um, I'm not sure what her title is now, uh, vice president for something. And, and we did talk about the, we did go through the water and sewer rates. It was part of a meeting that we had. Um, so I did brief them on it. They're obviously one of our largest, uh, well, they're tax exempt, but they're obviously not exempt from water and sewer rates. So um, they have all the methodology information and they, um, you know, they're, you know, they have access to the calculator. So I think they're gonna be able to go through. And we actually did run some of this, we did run um, a few scenarios. We didn't put them on here because we were spoke, focused on business, but we did, um, so just by way of example, we did pull up like a dorm, um, uh, and we, you know, we took a, dorm, one, a dormitory and just looked at what the impacts would be. So we did run a few scenarios like that, but, but we've given them all that information so they'll be able to, uh, to run that data. Um, so, um, so that's my, I guess that's, it's very difficult to do that global uh, comparison that you want. But, I'm, uh, you know, for, for our tax rate, for example, we have, a, we have a single rate for both residential and commercial, and we know that it's but something a, like 80, 20, 70, but 30. But there's a residential class, there's a, there's a commercial class. Industrial, yeah, it's classified that way. It's classified it's set up that, that way, way specifically. Um, and that's what DOR requires. So that's not how we classify, um, that's not how we classify our system. So um, if we were gonna switch to a system like that, which I, that's not really, um, again, it gets difficult to, to use a commercial class because commercial, you could see from that breakdown that not all commercial customers use water the same way. Mm -hmm. um, so it's hard, you know, comparing a bookstore to a laundromat to a brewery, mm -hmm. um, it, it doesn't really make sense. So um, you would literally have to go through all 9,000 records individually and try to cross-reference the address and try to then determine which ones are businesses. So, and I don't know that it would give you much data. Could you do like everybody with over a two inch meter, which would clearly leave out all the residences? What's that? Could you do, could you compare everybody over a two inch meter now with their current rate? Certainly, yeah. yeah and, and, we have a, and, we, and we have a two inch meter size, we had some two inch meter sizes in there mm -hmm. and we had two inch meter, um, you know, hypotheticals as well. Um, but I, I suppose we could, I think we could do that, right? Yeah, because I don't think there are many residences with a two inch service, so that might be a, unless it's a way a, to approximate. Unless it. it's a bigger, bigger we, house. Again, I don't think we can s pull up the, number of gallons used by everybody who has a two inch meter yeah. and up yeah. in, a, in a year period. Okay. <coughs> in order to
to prepare the table with the local businesses that the mayor described, we had to go to each customer account to do that. So there's no universal way even for the two-inch meters, Council Murphy, to say, okay, all 139, however many two-inch meters we have, what the total consumption is and figure out averages that way. You know, we have a, the, the utility billing system that the city's used for a long time was set up to do one thing, and granted, they're, we're making changes now, and it's not, it's not set up in a way to give us the data that you're asking for. It could be in the future. We could probably answer these questions pretty easily in the future, but for now, things uh, were never set up that way, and there was no need for them really to be set up in that mm -hmm. fashion. Uh, you had more questions, all right. Um, the, the slides that show the increases for the businesses, um, those are helpful, but my concern is that our rates are, I think, comparatively high to begin with compared to some of our neighboring communities. And the projection, the proposals, um, well, I've heard that that the rates are going to go up 5% per year. So I'm wondering, um, my concern is that it'll make us less competitive in, in attracting businesses or it might be difficult in retaining businesses. So I'm wondering if we've done any sort of comparison on um, not only the increases on that slide, yeah, but our rates and future rates being that they're going to go up 5% per year and on top of that, so uh, rates tend to be higher. I just, I just want to be clear, the, 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 revenue, the revenue chart says uh, what we're trying to achieve is 2% water growth per year in revenue and 3% uh, and growth in sewer revenue per year. That doesn't mean the rates will go up. Everybody's bill is going to go up 3% and 2%. There's different, uh, you know, it, dep it depends on a lot of multiple variables. It's not just like, okay, take your rate and times it by 2% um, and then add that. It's not, that's not how it'll work. So I just want to be clear of what that means. We are trying to build a glide path that, that creates that much revenue, but it's also through a combination of fixed charges as well as, as, well as the volumetric. So that's number one. Number two, and I know we talked about this last time, um, it's very difficult to compare water bills and sewer bills from community to community. Um, so Springfield, the city of Springfield, for example, um, and, and this kind of is, you know, Northampton uh, is kind of a tweener community, like we're, a, we're not a big city, but we're not a small town. We're sort of a, you know, we're a small city of 30,000. When you look at our infrastructure, our water and sewer infrastructure, so Springfield has like a reservoir system. They have a huge reservoir and some backup reservoirs in Ludlow. They have dams, they have pumping stations, they have a very similar setup uh, to us. Um, and then they have, you know, miles and miles of service lines. Uh, the difficulty is the number of gallons and the number of customers they have that they're servicing through that infrastructure is exponentially larger than us. We're still, we're still maintaining an infrastructure like that, as you can see by, you know, we're having to make these investments in our reservoirs, um, but we have a small customer base. So the per capita costs of our customers versus a Springfield customer are higher to maintain that system. Then you go to a smaller system like East Hampton, which again is a much smaller population, a much uh, less complicated uh, water system. They don't have a reservoir type system. They have an underground well system that serves their community. Um, a much different level of, uh, of infrastructure. Do they have a new water treatment plant? They do have a water treatment plant, obviously on a smaller <coughs> scale than ours. But so that's the difficulty of comparing, you know, why are the rates in Springfield different than the rates in East Hampton, different than rates in Northampton. I will say that when you look at our, you know, in terms of a business side, um, you know, we're trying to provide, you know, clean water, uh, you know, good sewage, et cetera. Um, we're also providing other incentives to businesses that put us far and above uh, in a better position than any other community in the valley um, in terms of, uh, you know, our tax rate, that, that single tax rate that we have. And I think I showed a slide at the combined budget meeting that showed where our tax rate puts us, which is really one of the lowest ta commercial tax rates in western Massachusetts. Uh, and we're in like the lowest, you know, we're like in the bottom quartile of commercial tax rates uh, in Massachusetts, like in the 200s. Um, so there's also that that you have to factor in as well um, in terms of infrastructure. Okay. Well, I, um, it is. I, 
Uh, one, one more. Well, I, and I'm still on this question. Then I have another. I mean, well, I, I want to get to the public before. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, so, I, but I also have some. Try and wrap it up so we can hear from the public. So, I mean, I, I understand that um, different communities have different challenges and obstacles and situations with respect to water and sewer, but with respect to comparing bills, it's actually quite easy. I mean, if you're a business coming to the city, you look at the bill and it's not complex at all for them to take a look at it and, and make a decision based on not just that, but, but vari a variety of factors, that being one of them. Um, so. But it, but I would I guess I would say to you that if but, I go but, but if I go into that's a, why, that's a locally why. owned store and I see a price for something versus I go into a national chain or a larger operation, that's why I'd like to see understand. comparisons from neighboring communities, particularly um, that uh, that's absolutely terrific that we have a relatively low um, tax rate and a single rate. But I'd like to know um, of the other communities because there are many that have a single rate as well. I'd like to know of those communities which which of those communities have um, uh, you know, um, a, a rate structure such as the one we're proposing, as opposed to the rate structure co uh, compared to the, you know, the one we have, as opposed to the one we're proposing, and, you know, but have the other things as well. I mean, there, you know, we also have a variety of other things like, you know, um, the Community Preservation Act and and various other things. So it's, I think, you know, I think that overall affordability for a business it's 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 more than just saying we have a single tax rate we're affordable come to northampton i just don't think it's that simple but i'll move on from that point uh, I, I would actually why don't you hold on because we we really did this to hear more from the public so we can continue your questions later we can stay for the evening but i want to let the public get up and speak for a minute because we really had the public hearing to get them here um so what i might do is a caveat i'm going to um, for the people whose names I have, I'm going to announce your name and address. When we get to the point where you're not on the list, please give us your name and address when you come up. And please, any questions you have for the mayor, Mr. Lord, or please run them through the chair. Don't get involved in a back and forth with uh, the mayor or the, or the finance director or, or the TPW director. So the first person I have on my lip list is Chip Parsons, Mill Valley Road in Northampton. If you, uh, Hadley, oh, Mill Valley Road in Hadley. But you have farmland, correct? And you're, and you're actually the chair of the Northampton Ag Commission? Or a mem I'm on, I'm a member. You're a member of the Ag Commission. Do you want to come up and uh, ask what questions you? Uh I, I apologize because I'm. We have a seven o'clock meeting across the hall with Mr. Fighten. Um, but uh, my question, or what I wanted to ask, uh, was there any rate uh, reduction being considered for agriculture, which is done in many communities surrounding us? Um, uh, we we all know the importance of water, obviously, and and. Uh, but ag runs on small margins, and and like <laughs> say, many communities have a reduced rate. And I just wanted to have that considered. I, get, I mean, the, you got community gardens, you got Smith School, you got all of us that farm. Uh, it, it, it it impacts quite a few people, and the city has been a good, strong supporter of agriculture, and we'd like that to continue. So I just want to make that point. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Mayor, you want to address this? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. And I know he's got to get to his Ron. meeting. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, that's something we can certainly take a look at. Um, it was not, uh, you know, in the initial calculation, in terms of large scale, um, you know, water usage uh, for agriculture. It was not something that was identified as something that needed that was to called out. But we can try to get some more data on that to the extent we can. Um, do, you, do you want to address that? Yeah, just briefly, I think. Um, there was just a little bit of con uh, discussion, I believe, with a consultant in this regard. And the, and the the concern from a water supply standpoint is that um, for agricultural use, you still have to take the water and treat it. And you you have all the expenses that you have to to create a water that's that's potable so that you can drink it, and then to use it for agriculture is sort of a. Um, uh, You're saying your cost of water is the same whether you put it on a plant or right, it is. on the table. It is, right. So that was um, one reason, I think, that um, we didn't explore that in any detail. Mm -hmm. All right. um, the next uh, person who's on my list is William Gonski. Uh, 68 Golden Drive and Florence. The only other thing I would just add, the, the finance director, of, of course, points this out, is that you know, anytime you do that, you're shifting those costs to some other customer. Um, so that's the other thing that we're trying to balance out. Um, so I think I'll need to check with uh, Chip after and talk to some folks about um, 
just how irrigation is happening if some of uh, just, just to really understand what scale we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And put the community gardens on your list too, because I know that the community gardeners also, I think, don't they get water? Uh, well, that's, I believe the city provides that water, correct? Or not? Or we, we build them. I think we build them. Yeah. 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 They have a hose that we build them for. So, yeah, we'll, okay. we'll take a look at that. Great. Right. Thank you. So, Mr. It's Golaski. Golaski, I'm sorry. Yep. So I've been a resident of Florence for 27 years. I hold a, a plumbing license in the state of Connecticut. I did speak at the last meeting. Um, after the last meeting, I found a little bit of new information. I found out that in 2014, our city won an award from the DP, DEP for using what was stated as well below the average consumption of the 65 gallon per day capita. So the city's currently conserving, we're below what the uh, state's asking for at the current time. And we keep on kind of hammering on this conservation, conservation, conservation. I know that water's an important commodity, but do we really need to conserve as much as we're talking about? I, I would question that. Um, conservation also leads to lack of revenues um, if we don't have a water issue for the city, which thus makes rate increases needed. So once again, we save on this side, we charge on this side. Um, earlier this year, the city council said that affordability is paramount to our city. I don't believe that our current or proposed water and sewer rates promote affordable living in the city of Northampton. Um, it's not helping us fill those empty storefronts when you look at the total cost of doing business. Um, you may look at that one tax rate, but that's not everything to be in business in a city. There's multiple items that add up to your costs. Um, city Council also said that we want to focus on finding young family places to live and senior and hopefully keep seniors in our city. Um, our current and proposed rates in my mind do not promote that type of thought. Um, in regards to the different rate sizes based on meters, it, that truthfully makes no sense to me. I think it's discriminatory towards um, larger families, and I'll use families, and potentially gives commercial accounts lower rates. Um, rates should be set on usage, if anything. Um, how much you use is how much you pay for, not you know what size your meter is, because you could you know if that's the case, I'd like a two-inch meter so I can get a lower rate. In the past 10 years, um, and this was based on numbers on the city website, water in Northampton has increased 71.44% in the last 10 years. That's over 7% a year. Sewer has increased 52%, over 5% a year. I question once again if this is affordable living when hopefully an average person might get a two to three percent increase in their pay on a yearly basis. Um, we can do the math, it doesn't add up that great. I would also question as part of the budget, um, we had a five year plan of putting aside $200,000 for land acquisitions. I would question the mayor and the water department if that's required by the DEP or e EPA or is it just would be nice that we own that property around that reservoir. It'd be nice if I owned a Cadillac, but I can't afford one, so I drive a Chevrolet. A million dollars would go a long way towards the projects. Basically, that five-year plan had $8 million worth of projects, a million dollars, and land acquisitions that I can't see that we potentially need would go a long way towards infrastructure. Um, I, I truthfully believe that the rate should be frozen at the current rates or levels or even decreased um, based on the percentages of increases that we've seen in the last 10 years. Um, I also have had another two more questions. On the 16 CCF conservation rate with the household average of 2.07, is that Northampton's household average, a state average, or a national average. Um, it, that seems awful low to me. 
Um, also in the comparison bill column with the cell phone and cable. Luckily, cell phone and cable are optional bills. If I decide not to have a cell phone or cable TV, I can get rid of it. Unfortunately, water is not an optional fee. We all need water to survive, so we're kind of stuck with that one. So, um, And then one other thing I'd like to point out, if you were to look at the customer impact on the local businesses, um, we say that the average household is at 16. Florence Hardware Business came in at 8 CCF. I would assume they basically have a toilet, maybe two, and a sink, maybe a shower. I, pr I probably would guess that they don't shower there. They're almost close to what we're calling the average household usage. Um, I don't foresee that Florence Hardware has a lot of outdoor use, and I would potentially question on a lot of the charts on when these numbers were taken. Are these winter numbers? I'm sure summer numbers are going to be much higher in the rates if you if you factor in the outside usage factor of it. So you could potentially make it look pretty tasty if you took your December billing where you're not using any outside water. I would be interested to see it over years worth of usage with the highs and the lows and then what's the true increase. If we look at the lowest amount, we're going to have the lowest increases. So I appreciate you listening to my comments. Thank you. And the, the one question in there I think was uh, with regards to uh, you. So the um, those. 2.07. Yeah, that is Northampton. That is our, That's average. our average. Yeah, to that is, and and it's actually pretty tracks pretty close to the state average as well. Mm -hmm. um, so the, uh, you know, we've had a. That's why we've lost, you know, congressional districts in each of the last <laughs> two decades because our population mm -hmm. is uh, the size of families and our population is shrinking. Um, the um, the average quarterly consumption. Um, we actually took a full year of water usage. Uh, we took a complete year of water usage, and then we did an average of those four uh, quarters mm -hmm. of that full year. Uh, so we weren't cherry picking a winter number or a summer number. Uh, we were taking an average, uh, mm -hmm. just again, to try to give people, like it says, an average quarterly consumption. Um, uh, in terms of Florence Hardware, they're um, they're at eight CCF. It's like half of sixteen. So that's half of sixteen. So they're actually fifty percent of the conservation rate. Um, the um, and then the other, well, I was going to ask well, Mr. Laurel yeah. to talk about the land acquisition, which I know okay. the counselors are f are somewhat familiar with because mm -hmm. we often come forward yeah. with a combination of grants and other um, mm -hmm. another funding to try to secure. Um, some of the protection areas around our watershed. Sure, so there were just a couple of questions about land acquisition and the importance to the city's water quality. Um, it's viewed within um, the DEP world and, and uh, the world of, of water suppliers that the best, uh, best protection for any public water supply is to protect the water quality in the watershed where you get your water from. So. Um, that's sort of a key part of any strategy for any public water supplier is to protect the watershed where you're getting your water from. The city is obligated by DEP to have a watershed resource protection plan which outlines our strategy for protecting the water quality of the city. Um, one important element of that watershed resource protection plan is um, a land acquisition plan. So if you go to our watershed resource protection plan, you'll see where I've identified the properties that we own, properties that are protected, state forest or whatever use. Um, land that it's uh, under private uh, ownership and then over time we've acquired um, parcels of land as the councilors know. Um, since 2009 um, we've, uh, we've acquired about 251 acres of land within the watershed. Um, it's something that um, is viewed very favorably by the state and something that we're proud of actually in terms of protecting the city's water. Um, and we commonly will get grants. There's not a lot of grants in this world for many things but for land protection, for water supply, there, there is grant money. And uh, over the last five years, um, we've secured over $400,000 in state grants that have offset the purchase price of a number of the properties that we've purchased. So we feel it's a good program and it's been very successful. Um, and ultimately, in terms of the water quality for the city in the long run, um, it's the best way to, to, uh, to provide protection for that water quality. Mm -hmm. 
So the fewer septic tanks in the watershed, the better. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And just a couple of questions since you brought up DEP. Across, you know, the the entire two bar graphs you showed about uh, prospective debt service. Um, most of the work we're doing has been mandated by higher authority, correct? Yes. The, the, the water filtration plant was mandated. The updates to the sewage treatment plant are mandated. The updates to the dike system were mandated. It's not like we elected to thought that was a good idea. It was imposed upon us, correct? That's right. Um, we have the city operates under a highly regulated environment for both water and sewer, environmental protection agency on the federal level, and DEP on the state level. Uh, highly regard all of our activities in terms of protecting the environment and public health and safety. So mm -hmm. those are the reasons why we do things. Okay. So the next name I know I'll get right because it's Mike Kirby, 134 North Street in Northampton. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, this is, I'm sitting here scratching my head like usual um, because this is a very difficult complex matter. Um, the one, um, one element that I'd like to know more about is the quarterly fire protection charge, um, which seems to be regulated by the size of the pipe uh, that feeds the their, their street, I guess. Um, and like the six inch one comes out to 170 on the quarterly charge and a total of $684 a year. And I'd like to know more about why the, the fire protection charge, what is like the average pipe size uh, downtown and out in the outskirts, like in the um, Leeds and that area. Um, in other words, what is this? What is this bias? Uh, mm -hmm. Just have have one more question. Sure. Here. So you understand that that's not a fire. Ch that's not a, a charge that you'll pay. That's not a charge that you will pay. That we're charging all customers. It's a charge that we only are gonna charge a facility that has a separate unmetered fire line uh, in addition to their main water line going to a business. Um, they have a separate unmetered, uh, we actually just put one in at the, Flor at the Florence Fire Station um, because we installed a sprinkler system there with a FEMA grant, so we had to run a separate fire line uh, to that building. So it's really a charge on only those customers, which is a, a, a much smaller universe of customers that have a fire suppression system. Um, you know, this is common, Springfield, Boston, Worcester, um, you can, lots of other uh, communities do it. Um, it's been upheld, uh, you know, by, its, by the SJC. Um, it's, uh, it's um, and again, it's, it's generally tied to the size of the infrastructure. That's why the fee uh, no. tap, taps into no. that. Yeah, so I'm not, we're not charging you and Lou an extra charge <laughs> for fire protection. <laughs> yeah. um, we're not doing that. Oh, good. Um, no. uh, unless you decide to put a sprinkler system in, uh, then, yeah. then there'd be that charge. But even then, if you had a residential home, you may not have a, a two-inch line. You may have a smaller line. So we're not, um, part of the reason why we're going uh, two-inch and above is there are, there's very few residential systems uh, I think there's a, like a handful, and we're actually trying to incentivize some of those people to to put some sprinkler systems in. So, it, so anyway, that that's so it really wouldn't affect um, anyone who's a residential customer. We're not talking about the fire hydrants or the fire flow there. We're talking about if a separate line has to be tapped off of our line to go to a business. That's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. yep. and Mike, you had another question. Do you have one, another question? Yeah. Why don't you go right ahead while you have the floor? Well, I'll hold off, okay? Can I? Yeah, you can. can I'll, we'll do do a, do a last call, um, and uh, Fred Zeminich. Yeah, Fred Zimach. Zimach. I've okay. been trying to say Zeminich all night, and no, I know it's wrong. It's too silly. Even Pam tried to correct me. Yeah. I apologize. Okay, like and you're, to, uh, you're on Pomeroy 
Tom, Tom, Roy, Tom Terrace. Roy Terrace, 23. I'd like to thank the mayor uh, for trying to answer my questions. Um, I think he tried to answer the question about the affordable city, but I think it needs a little more work. Um, two things that concern me uh, probably mainly is the projection of the rates beyond fiscal 17 to 18, 19, and 20. Can we do that? Are they going to be the same? Um, we can try to do some of that using our modeling. Yeah. Obviously, the vote, you know, it's a, it, they have to be voted on annually. We're not voting on them on a five year basis. So we'll be, we'll be renewing them every year. Um, but we can certainly show you or try to figure out what the underlying assumption would be. Uh, the other question that I had was um, could you compare the revenues for fiscal 16 to 17 to get an idea how much more money you're getting, or how much more money you're collecting? Certainly. Uh, She's not here. We can give you that. Um, we, well, <laughs> yeah, part of it's sort of the, the revenues are tied to the rates. So we haven't, we are sort of in stasis in terms of the enterprise fund budgets, but we are, the rates are projected to raise an additional 2% revenue on the water enterprise fund and the sewer enterprise fund is projected to go up 3%. Okay, so, so if I would look at each year, it would go 2%, 2%, increase 2% each the year. The overall enterprise fund, yes. The goal is to okay. generate that much um, additional. But that doesn't necessarily reflect the people's individual bills. That's right. It's I like it differently, but I'm just trying to find out how big the okay. pot's Adam's getting. Are you getting yeah. Yeah. twice as much money, no. four times as much yeah. money? And um, the other uh, item that I had was about conservation, and it was brought up last time, and I guess I didn't understand it, but if you look at the rates for the five-eighths inch, five inch pipes, the cost of the water goes down until you reach the next size of pipe. So how, how does that get somebody to conserve if he knows that if he uses more water, it's going to be cheaper? Um, it had to do with the fixed charge being added into it. It actually goes, I'm not sure what you mean, because when you use more water above 16 CCF, it goes up. Yeah. Does the fixed charge affect that? The cost of water yep. goes down <laughs> until you get to the next size pipe. Are you incorporating the fixed charge into no. that as well? Okay. Yeah. But I mean, what's what's how are you conserving? What in this plan makes me conserve? Uh, well, the idea was we heard a lot of feedback from residents uh, at the public hearings we held last year that said that they are they are trying to collect rainwater, they're trying to save bath water, they're trying to take less showers, they're trying to keep their consumption down. And I, I, I'm mathematically, I, I, you know, if you lower your consumption, you're going to pay less, correct? True. So that's. But I mean, I mean what specifically in the plan will make me conserve water? Uh, well, the I didn't see well, the thought. Well, we, we actually, we what we didn't talk about, and we did, we mentioned this the last time. Uh, we are also doing the the department is also going to be doing some other conservation measures for people. Um, We've got these great uh, water conservation kits that we're going to make available to people, uh, which have you know the aerator uh, you know inserts and have the there's a, actually a thing that you can mimic a low flow toilet. Um, it's a free kit that we can give to people, and then the things we do like with rain barrels. I mean that's a water conservation right, measure. Okay, but I'm um, looking for things in the plan. Well. Uh, well, the, I mean, the, the clearest way to build in conservation among residential homeowners is to have the two-tiered rate that, that does provide you your first 16 CCFs of water, um, you're paying less. When you get above that, you're, you'll start to pay more. So, I mean, I guess that's, and we tried to show you that um, we established the conservation rate using that sort of standard for what is average daily consumption for you and me. It's supposed to be, we're, we're supposed to use ideally 65 gallons of water a day per person. Anything over that, they would consider to be non-essential uses. So the idea is to try to track people as much to 65 gallons per day, and in an average household in Northampton, that's 16 CCF. So uh, that's where we came up with it. So. Mm -hmm. I have one final question. Yeah, step up to the mic so we can hear you. I saved the, the dumb question for the, for the end. <laughs> and, and basically what happened is I looked at the water and sewer rates 
that were posted on the assessor's wall, and I found that they increase around six or seven percent a year. So I tried to answer the question why they do increase six or seven percent a year. My inclination would have been to say that it's due to inflation, it's due for, to salaries. But what I see here is that the increases are not due to inflation or salaries, but they're due to repairs and maintenance. So, okay, you've got this plan, you've got your repair and maintenance that you're gonna do, it's gonna run out until, what, 2021? We're sh that's what we're showing, kind of a five-year model. Okay, so you get we have a for, we okay. also projected beyond that as well. Okay, so you got this five-year model. You're going to do all these repairs. You're going to buy this property, blah blah blah, whatever else. You're going to fix the pipes, and at the end of those five years, supposedly you've taken all those increases that we've given you. You've spent them. The job's done. It's free. What happens to the rates? They go down. So they stay stay constant. Let me address that. Um, <laughs> I know, and I know that you talked about. Um, I think you got the link I sent you. Didn't? Did you get the link? I, I, I didn't see your email. I haven't oh. been on a computer since three o'clock. Okay. Well, I, I actually sent it okay. uh, many days ago. But um, on that, on that, um, on the website, there actually was the. There's a table, that static table. Then below it, there's actually percentages. But I'll, I'll send you the. I may not have your right email address, but. Um, you are correct that there was a period during um, there were significant increases every year and you can track them they're on our website there's a water and sewer rate um, historical table um, and it started I think in 2002 there was like a 22 percent increase and what you're seeing there is the cost of building the uh, water filtration plant that we were mandated by consent to build at a cost of third $29 million. So we're still carrying the debt service on that project. And so we didn't raise the rates to pay cash. We paid the rates to, you know, we raised the rates to cover mostly the debt service. We do pay cash for some small projects. Um, and, and um, but we're still, if you go back to that, well, the financial model, some of the existing debt that you see, which is a big chunk of our expenses, is we're still paying down that debt. Um, so, but you're right, as old debt comes off, then you're able to then either swap it out or you're right, lower the rates once we get those projects completed. But if we're gonna borrow 29 million, uh, you know, we're gonna actually, we are gonna try to borrow as much of it as we can, as early as we can, because the rates are so favorable right now. So we're gonna try to bundle as many of those things together. That's why on the, on the you know, whatever the earlier plan we show like in 19 like you know over 20 million but you know you, you actually won't construct and actually go to bond probably till 21 but whatever that just shows you how cuz usually you short term borrow during the construction phase but but then we're not just going to we're not just going to write a check for 29 million on that day sure. we're going to bond and then we're going to so yeah. part of that plan yeah. is we're going to try to have enough of the debt service to pay it over but it's going to take us uh, probably, I don't know, how long are we bonding, Susan? Um, different pro projects are different times. Yeah. So engineering is less than... Yeah, but we may actually even look at a longer-term bond. Uh, there's been some relief. Uh, there's been some changes. So typically, like, the police station is a 20-year bond. Um, so that's sort of a model. So, so sometime so in the future, the rates will go down. Most, that, that is definitely... But it's never done that in the past. That would be the hope, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, but of course, you know, labor costs, electricity costs, uh, costs of all the other things have also continued. There's also just normal inflation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, I mean, previously it was like six percent going to seven percent. Mm -hmm. That's much more than inflation. Mm -hmm. you're, you're well, correct. You're correct. Yeah. but it was it was part of their debt schedule plan in order to raise enough revenue to carry the debt service on that uh, on that particular plant, which we're still carrying. Mm -hmm. Well, and the other problem is, you know, if you even if you look at a 20-year bond for these projects. That's provided that our friends at DEP or EPA don't come up with any other expensive, bright ideas that they oppose on oppose on us in the meantime. Yeah, which is why it tends to, you know, it gets to a plateau and it stays there because as one thing gets paid off, another one comes down the pike that you then have to deal with. Unfortunately. No, I think ideally we would. Yeah, when we start to pay down projects, you know, just like we're doing with our debt exclusion projects, you know, we we just paid off the JFK. Uh, override last year that was a 20-year debt exclusion that's now gone off the books of course now the police station steps, is steps in to really um yeah. is going to step up because well, we've we, only done like th three or four years 
Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and we did a hybridized model um, to let the JFK get out of the way before we started paying for that. So there, you're constantly, Susan is has a debt schedule that she's always looking at to try to see how when debt comes off, can we then work in more projects? So the goal isn't to try to, obviously we're trying to keep the rates at a reasonable rate. And I would say that when you look at that history of six, 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 seven, and then you look at the last two years, we basically had a two, a zero, because we did a zero in water and sewer last year, and then now we're proposing. We appreciated that. Yes, and now <laughs> we're proposing this revenue increase. We're trying to keep them at a moderate level, not at the six or seven percent level, and part of that's by diversifying the um, revenue stream as well. Mm -hmm. Are there any other members of the public that want to speak before we let Mr. Kirby do his other question? You Spence, you want to? Yeah. You're not on the list, but come on up. Howdy, 19 Mark Circle. Um, I just had a couple questions. I don't, should I just ask them in a row and then? Mm -hmm. you, okay. Um, I'd, I've tried to look this up and I wasn't able to figure it out. I just want a definition so that I know what I'm talking about. About what what does improve equity among customer types mean? Because I, I really I don't I I'm clueless as to what that means. And listening here, I now I understand that. We actually can't tell the difference between business and residential. So, does customer types only mean the meter size? Um, and there was some issue with getting that data. So, I, that, I want to know what that is. What, what's improve equity among customer types? Um, another question is what's the penalty for not meeting the discharge permit? Um, and are all the other communities surrounding us meeting their discharging permits? Um, and then for fire protection, why not have a volumetric charge on fire protection too? That way, if a building catches on fire and the sprinklers go on, you charge them for having put in the lines and then you charge them for every gallon of water that comes out to put the fire out. That, that, that'd make a lot of revenue for the city. Um, and with fire protection, that's something that people have to have, right? And it's something that's been there, it's infrastructure, it's for safety. So. Would it be okay to have a sidewalk charge? We're gonna have institute a sidewalk charge or a bike lane charge. Oh, your your house is next to the bike path, so there's a, there's a charge for that, because you, you have the privilege of being next to the bike path. Um, the tax exemption qualification um, that people can apply for. Um, does that make this a tax? And why are you applying for it at the assessor's office if, it, if it's not a tax? It seems like it would qualify as that. Um, and on the fixed charges, it seems the, the, the council is going to have no oversight on the fixed charges whatsoever. So not that I think that this would happen, but this is hyperbole to, to make the point. If, if the fire protection charge went to a million dollars, right, the, the council would have no way, it, constituents were calling incessantly saying, this is a problem, this is a problem, I can't afford to pay a million dollars a year for, for fire protection, I can't do it. They'd have, they're, they're, there's no recourse for them unless in four years they vote the mayor out and then they have to vote a new mayor in to then change the fire protection charge. Um, in the plan it says larger than one meter, so that, I want to know, does that not include uh, one meter? And the mayor was nice enough to, to publish his water and sewer bill, which I thought was very generous. Um, and he's using, uh, let's see here, 21, I believe it is, which if you go by average, right, he's, he's over. And if you go by the average, he said, for Northampton, which was 16 CCF, um, he's 5 CCF over typical usage. And I, I mean, I don't think that the mayor would be purposefully wasteful with 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 the water. Um, last thing is, um, we cited uh, you know the the fact that families we don't have enough families, people are moving out, etc. But yet, for apartment buildings, right, they're going to be paying the higher rate for water and the higher meter fee, and that's going to get passed on to the the renters. So the renters are going to feel that, and we'll get even less families. Um, math question, because uh, I'm terrible at it. Um, I was looking at the water rate and the sewer rate, and it says we're going to get charged 80% of our water usage. Um, but there's a 23.68% increase in the cost 
so it's I mean it's not really I mean <laughs> it's not really a decrease it's uh, you're, you're gonna be charged less percentage wise but you're charged more as a total and um, again same question that he asked I don't think people have really been able to address this anyone yeah and I, I hope that someone can just slay this thing the city is going to sponsor conservation efforts for families giving them aerators giving them all different ways to conserve which sounds great but then you look at the projections and you look at the plan and we have a line that on, on this graph that is just going one direction up so I mean if people conserve and the city helps them to conserve where does the money come from I don't, I don't understand how there can be more revenues with more conservation I just it doesn't make sense to me thank you all right Okay, I'm going to try to remember all those. I'll start start from the last. If you want, I'll try the one. <laughs> oh, yeah, great, awesome. Okay. If you want, as a, as a former assessor, when you're done with the rest, I'll talk about the... Yeah, the so the conserv... Uh, and I'm going to have um, Jim talk about one of those questions. Any, any of them. Yeah, the, I mean, the conservation thing. I mean, we really looked at, um, you know, this is, you know, Northampton has a major focus on being a sustainable community, using our resources wisely. These are, you know, these are, uh, you know, precious resources in many parts of the world uh, and actually many parts of the country. So we feel it's important to have some conservation aspect built into the plan. Now, and that's sort of wearing our sustainable Northampton hat. If we're just going to approach this as we're, um, you know, water salesmen, then we're probably going to walk around in trucks and tell you to take 20 minute showers. Um, but that's not really what we're going to do. We're trying to build a system that is clean and affordable and, and also try to encourage people. Because what we heard from people is we want to want to reduce our expenses. And one of the ways to do that is to is to help them conserve. That's why water, you know, companies are, get, are, are incentivizing low flush toilets and uh, efficient washing machines, et cetera. Um, you know, that's, so that's, that's the basis for that. Um, and if it may result in some uh, decreased uh, consumption, that's true. Um, but again, one of the goals of moving away from a 99.6% um, consumption-based rate system um, is to is to allow for some variations without major you know, is to try to get away from just revenue based costs. Um, wow. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, in terms of equity among customer types, when we went into this, we wanted to look at what are the different customer uh, types that we have, and mainly what that breaks out to are a, a sort of a large class of mostly smaller customers and, uh, that, and, then, and then another class of larger customers. When we went into this, uh, that was one of the goals of the study was to really look at, um, right now we basically had a flat system, a flat tax. Um, if you had the largest, if you were the largest uh, pipe and the largest water user in the city, you were paying the same uh, amount for your water as the smallest pipe and the smallest user. So that's what we meant in terms of equity among user types. Uh, we didn't say equity among residential and commercial or any of that. Um, this is clearly a, not a tax. It's a fee. It's based on uh, consumption and it's based on you know uh, your your um, use of the infrastructure. Um, and that's well supported. Um, in terms of the assessor piece, I mean, what we were trying to do was use an existing state approved discount program um, that is already in place and that it already has a certification process. Um, and that's why we chose the assessor's office uh, to do the certification. We actually do it for the, you know, the tax. CPA does it. They, What's that? The CPA uses that same exactly. certification. Yeah. Uh, and that's a surcharge. Uh, and then the other, we also used it for the tax work-off program. Um, we, we, because they're already in the business of meeting with people confidentiality and reviewing, and confidentially and reviewing their income statements, um, it made more sense rather than creating another whole system that somebody would have to administer to just use the existing system. But I don't think, 
um, that converts it to a tax by doing it mm -hmm. that way. No, and it's and actually we did that with stormwater. Yeah. We actually used the same exemption system for stormwater, which is another utility fee, mm -hmm. and and the council ordinance applied that same standard. So this actually standardizes them all. And it's it's the same discount. It, it's either if you qualify, you get the same discount as, as anybody else does. So anyone who qualifies for the exemption that's statutory with the state for the assessors, what they figure out there, if you qualify, you get the same reduction that anyone else that qualifies does. It isn't graduated in any way. Okay. Yeah. In terms of my own uh, personal water usage, I will plead guilty to using uh, 2100 CF. Uh, a 21 CF, uh, which is above the rate. Um, um, my only defense is I have uh, two teenager, two teenagers at home, and we uh, do struggle with trying to get them to minimize their uh, their mm -hmm. shower time and water consumption time. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that that's what my usage is, and I'm going to pay more for the, the water that I go that I exceed the 16 CCF on. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and you know when our household. Uh, maybe shrinks in size and kids go off to college, then we may find ourselves getting closer to that goal. Um, but, you know, we try to use rain barrels, we try to do some of those things, but uh, that's, those are the facts in my household. You have really clean teenagers. Um, yeah, uh, yes. Um, what were the other, did you want to talk about the other one that had to do with, um, uh, so that's usage at my home. Um, Oh, in terms of the in terms of the fixed charges, let me just say, uh, you know, just like the council, if the council, uh, you know, the council is an elected body, the mayor is an elected body. The mayor has a, an administrative role under the charter, and I have to stand election. And if I were going to implement million dollar uh, fire fees, um, I would hear about it. I'd probably hear about it from the council first, um, and then I would begin to hear about it from the public. So I would be held to the same, uh, you know, corrective action that the council would be held to. Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of the fire uh, piece, um, while it's, tr you know, it, it, it's true that in some cases, nightclubs and some larger establishments, there is that mandatory nature. Um, I will say, though, that a water-based system is not mandatory. Um, there are non-water-based systems. So if somebody wanted to say, I'm going to do this off the water grid and I'm going to do it with a, a chemical-based suppression system, they could. And there are also some um, of our facilities that have their own water storage that they use um, on site. Uh, I believe the, v, did the VA still have a water? I think the VA may have taken theirs down. But I know one, we've had some independent water sources as well throughout the city. So again, I would just say that the fire, the way, the way that it's been approved for a fixed charge is this methodology that we're using. And just to, to follow up on that, we still have a cost to supply that system to them. And our hope is that they never need to use it. But even if they never use it, we still incur a cost to provide it. Mm -hmm. And you know, the hope is they never have to use their fire suppression system, but it still costs us something to make it available to them even if they don't use exactly. it. Exactly. It's an on-demand, uh, large capacity a source of water. And, and I'm assuming when they want it, yes. they want it. And at this point, all of the other ratepayers are subsidizing that service. Mm -hmm. So again, this is all about where the costs get shifted. So right now, Mike, you, you are paying for that. You don't have it at your house, but you are actually paying for it in your rate. Um, this system would try to capture some of the fixed costs of us providing that much capacity down the line mm -hmm. to all these businesses that need additional capacity so that if there is a fire, God forbid, then the system will work properly. Um, Wes, did that cover all your questions? Uh, you only have to only in the executive branch the power to, to administer that, that fee. Yep. It's non-negotiable, it's not doesn't go before the public. It it just is and it can be set. And I don't think voting the mayor out would be a, a way you know what I mean? It doesn't seem like a 
that, but that authority is actually established under Mass General Law. I mean, that's the, that, that, that authority is, is, that's the structure that we have and the charter is a Mass General Law as well. So the fee can't be, the fee can't be and, and that's the other piece of this is that the fee, um, whether the council sets it or I set it or anybody sets it, um, there is uh, a lot of case law that it has to be reasonable and it has to bear a relationship to the service that's being offered and you could actually be sued. You, you know, you can take people to court, and they do often. So you would have to build out that cost to show that so that you wouldn't have sued. You have to be able to show that it bears a reasonable uh, uh, proportion to your fixed cost of that service. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, that I mentioned there were some case law about some charges that were, there were some towns that were actually trying to implement a an actual fire protection uh, charge where they were actually going to, because um, it was sort of like the, you know, sort of like the Amherst situation. It wasn't Amherst, but I'm <laughs> saying it was a town that had some a specified universe of, of uh, users that needed like more fire apparatus to be able to protect them, and the town attempted to charge yeah. a special fee for that, and that was determined to be an illegal tax um, uh, and end around because it really didn't bear a reasonable. Was an actual fee for something. So, yeah. So the bur the burden of proof is, if in fact your charges exceed the reasonable cost to provide the service, then the court says then it is a tax. Exactly. Because it isn't related to the cost to provide the service. And you're just purely generating revenue and above and beyond. So the last one was the, the cost of living because of the the higher rate for all the apartment buildings. Well, again, I think that's another one that gets answered. I think. When you look at the that that exercise I did earlier, where you take the rates and you run them out, and so if you have an apartment building that's that's paying the larger rate and is and is and is consuming the equivalent of four single-family homes, you're actually going to pay less for your water consumption at the end of that exercise. So they actually there is a there is a savings built in, and then there's of course conservation measures that the landlord can do. The landlord could certainly put separate meters in if they wanted to. And there's one fixed charge for all that consumption, which is what results in that. Exactly. Yes, there's one fixed charge based on all of that consumption. Um, but if you run the numbers and you take an apartment building and you take my home and you run the comparison out, um, you'll find that over time, because you're paying that higher rate, it outstrips the 16 CCF, and you actually pay less. We've done that. We have that data. I just did it at the beginning of the meeting. I compared my, I compared my bill with the brewery, and I said so that you if you were talking about an apartment building. Yeah, but it's the same thing. I mean, if, if an apartment, apartment building and the brewery consumption. No, I'm saying that you're saying that there's a disparity between a residential home and an apartment building. I'm saying that if I use the amount of water that an apartment building uses, I would actually pay more than that apartment building would pay um, because of the way the rate works for larger users. Any apartment building is going to have a larger than a one inch meter. In fact, most of the dorms, you know, most of the, most of the Smith dorms or houses all have one and a half, two inch meters. Um, the property River Run condominiums has a two inch meter. Um, the housing authority properties, um, those are all in that same uh, category as well. So if you run those numbers out mathematically, a high consumption of water, they're going to pay a lower rate for consumption than I'm going to pay. I agree with you, and you're right about that. But what I'm, what I'm citing is that if you have multiple families living in an apartment building, right, yep. this rate, this tier one rate, yep. is never going to apply. It's Unless it's separately metered. So if you have an apartment building yep. that has multiple apartments, right, and they use what a normal family does, yep. say 22 CCF, right, then every single every single CCF inside that apartment building is paying six dollars and nine cents per CCF. Okay. I, I, I wish I, wish I had still the cheaper than me and my single family. I wish I had the six twenty one. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I know you have a larger than the average size family, mm -hmm. so, which I realize that's you know. Mm -hmm. I'm one of nine kids, and there's not many families of nine anymore around. So yeah. I, mm -hmm. I know what that's. And I would question how many city departments at a 70 to 50 percent increase in the last 10 years would survive in this city. Would we even have a city? Not a water question. So let's move on. Mike, did you have another question? Yeah. But I, right, go ahead. I'll, I'll yeah. try to do a scenario like that, where like I mean, if I had, if I could have access to the calculator, like take the 2100. 
take my 2100, multiply it by four, run and then run that consumption, 21, 48, uh, 96. So run 96 uh, CCF through the calculator on a 5 8 inch line and then run it through the calculator on a one and a half inch line. And the apartment building of multi family is going to end up paying less for the water consumption. Mm -hmm. So it's not going it, to, so, it, but I'm not saying, again, you can't capture within an apartment building individual units unless you have use. And so the only incentive would be to find an apartment that has individually metered or, or if the landlord wants to try to build that in. I don't know how landlords do this, how they address that. I don't know how they divide the Well, water. usually usually what they do is there's one service meter to the building and then you sub-meter the units. Yeah. So um, that reduction reduced rate would yeah. probably never apply since you're being metered by the city with yep. the one big meter and then you're sub-metering your tenants so they'd never see that below 16 rate yeah. because you're just getting a bill for, for the yeah. whole thing. I know Dr. Levinson oh. was here yeah. last time. Yeah. He has a situation where he's in an unmetered uh, and plaza and he's there with a, draw, a laundromat and he's there with a restaurant, another restaurant and he's there and I know that's an issue internally for that landlord and that customer because how do you apportion the water uh, correctly among those diverse users and there's a convenience store which probably doesn't use much water at all. So, okay, so let's hit our second question. Uh, Mike, you had one? Can you step up though? So did you have a question? Which one of you gentlemen had a second question? Yeah, just step up to the podium so we can hear you. You get to feel more distinguished and more a better human being when you stand in You front look more of distinguished every time I see you. It may be illusory. <laughs> um, <coughs> they were, I think the, the mayor said there were three large users. Um, five. Five. Five large users that are more or less off the grid. And um, I wanted to know who they are and is there the rate they pay should be public, right? The same rate. Yeah. Um, the five users are uh, Coca Cola, uh, Packaging Corporation, L3KEO, the, um, the uh, Cooley Dickinson Hospital, and the uh, Florence Casket Company. And so what's happening is, uh, like in the case of Coca Cola, they have, they're putting, they're using a lot of water, and they, but most of it is not going into the sewer system. Actually, the vast majority of it isn't going into the sewer system. So, uh, and they're using high capacities of it on a daily 24-hour rate. So they have a, uh, they were granted a special sewer meter um, that actually measures what does leave their facility and go into the storm, uh, into the water uh, system, the sewer system. Um, and so, and that's the same with Packaging Corp. And so there are some users because of a very special, because of their manufacturing process or, or however that uh, works, have those meters. Um, it's so not something you could do, you could not do sewer meters in everybody's home. It would be very difficult to have a reliable meter that wasn't getting clogged with my daughter's, <laughs> my daughter's hair after every shower um, or whatever else it would get clogged with. So that's why you, it's really not feasible to have a separate sewer meter in every home. But right. there are some large manufacturers that have a very water intensive purpose and they're really using a vast, it's not that 80% thing, it's more like, I don't even know what the percentage of water they're using that's not going in. I, I don't know what that is. But it's, you know. It would be nice that they cut down on the truck traffic on North 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 Avenue mm -hmm. too. They evidently you got to stay water related, Mike. True, true, and unrelated. We're not, we're not doing trucks. True, tonight. true, and unrelated. <laughs> Said it. Okay. Do you know the names of the areas communities that are using these consultants offhand? Um, we I can give you names. I I know. I think uh, I can certainly. If you go to their website, okay. they I, they've got they've got uh, plenty of the one that I the one that I found them on uh, initially was Arlington, Massachusetts. Uh, I think it's Arlington. Um, 
experience matrix in yeah. all these towns. Yeah, in their proposal, they listed a number of towns. Uh, you know, town of Belmont. They listed uh, Peterborough, Winthrop, Canton, okay. Portsmouth. Good. There's a whole. They're on, and they're. On, if you go to their website, we have a link to their website on our right. page. Um, but I had first discovered them because Arlington, Mass, which is a community that has a very uh, um, a, a well-regarded uh, town manager, and they have some really unique fiscal policies. Um, including the five-year, we, we borrowed that five-year plan from them. They had done it very successfully. So okay. they had just switched to a, uh, a tiered rate system. Um, but Springfield has a tiered rate system. Um, and I've mentioned before the MWRA, uh, which yeah. serves 61 communities. Uh, by statute, they have a tiered system. Uh, so that's 61 communities in and around Boston. Okay. I think Chicopee is served by them, okay. too. Okay, and the final thing. I happened to discover just by accident doing a a article about two of the dam fair two of the dams in the valley. Um, I went up to Williamsburg to see the dam that had failed the uh, the big uh, flood in the valley, and um, I discovered that the city of Northampton owns all the land that the old dam was on. Plus, it owns the watershed, uh, a couple hundred acres, I think, um, that we originally bought in something like 1870 or 1880 or something like that, that we were going to use that valley for our uh, water system. But we have never used that land, to my knowledge. And I'm just wondering, because that part of that land is 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 worth quite a bit of money because it's developable. Hmm. It's right on one of the major roads, and so I'm wondering when we look at our water rates, also look at the land that we own, and see if we can turn that into some cash to help some of these really high costs. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you're, you're all set, Mike? Yeah, I'm all set. Once Jim answers his question, and Fred has one more question. I'm going to answer one question, and I'm going to, I'm going to make a statement about something else that I'm thinking about, um, if I can do that. Um, the question about the land is actually a very good one. We, the city water department owns um, a lot of land. The vast majority of it is within our active watersheds and the reservoirs that we use. There is some land, uh, as Mike Kirby had just mentioned here, that isn't in our currently active watersheds. And it's something that we're aware of um, about whether it's in the long run in the city's best interest to continue to hold on to that property. Is there a need to hold on to it to expand the water supply in the future? Or if there isn't a need, then there, there might be a decision um, there to divest of, the, of some of those um, land holdings. But uh, some of them were purchased, as, as Mike indicated, a long, long time ago and probably not for very much money. Um, the other thing I wanted just to say about the, the rate um, organization proposal overall is that we've drilled down to, into a tremendous amount of detail about these tiers and the 65 gallons per capita per day, but there's sort of another um, global policy element to this, and that is the 65 gallons per person per day is really the sanctioned water use that the DEP has indicated to us in our permits. So having a structure to our rate system that's tied to a conservation rate for the amount of sanctioned water that this, the state is saying it's generally okay to take, it makes a lot of sense to have a rate structure the way that it's proposed. And the other thing that, that we didn't mention is that the way that the state enforces some of these things like the 65 gallons per capita per day is they, they tie it to actions for grants and loans that we get to improve our water and wastewater system. So if we want to take out a $30 million loan for the wastewater treatment plant improvements, if we go to the state and ask for a low interest loan or <coughs> grant or debt forgiveness on some of this, um, some of the money that we would look to, one of the things that they would ask us would be, well, how is the community conserving water? What steps has the community taken to, to conserve water and to get the usage below 65? Um, and one, one element of it is to say that we've made a significant improvement in the way that we build for water and sewer that's tied to the sanctioned water use that we're allowed under our permit. So that's one element that I happen to like a lot because it can save in the long run in terms of our ability to finance some of the bigger projects. One more question that I just remembered of last. Could you, can you stay up here? 
um, and I just I just remembered it, which was he asked, "What are the penalties for non-compliance mm -hmm. uh, that we're making these upgrades to the uh, wastewater treatment plant?" And what are the penalties? I'm assuming you were asking for a cost-benefit reason. Yeah. So are what, what are the fines? What are the fees? Are are other communities being fined or being monitored? Maybe you just wanted to describe what the what the regulatory um, uh, system is like for waste. Water. Sure. I'm not sure at the moment. I believe that most of the area of wastewater treatment plants are meeting their permit um, in the Connecticut River and in our area. Um, but under the Clean Water Act, the penalties can be significant for noncompliance with your permit. I believe they can be up to $10,000 a day. Potential um, higher fines or imprisonment for people that um, are involved in not assisting a community in the way that they should in order to meet permits. So. Some of the, I looked this up a few years ago, and it's quite draconian it can be if you don't meet your permit. So it's really a road that you really don't So it's not like Obamacare. You can't game the system and just pay the penalties. No. Yeah, no. no. It's also the same on the water side as well. It is. Um, do, do most surrounding communities meet the 65 per gallon mm -hmm. capita? That was the question. I, I do not know. I, I couldn't tell you that. It's a Get rid of state them. goal, and we're looking at Northampton, so. Um, so anyway, yeah, I don't, I don't know that. Fred, did you, do you have one more, have one more question? One more question, and that is, uh, if I find out that uh, I'll have a cheaper rate by going to a one-inch pipe, can I go to a one-inch pipe or a bigger pipe? A cheaper rate with a one-inch pipe. I save money going. To oh, the because pipe. we talked about the fact that some of the larger consumers end up paying a little less because. If you were going out that far, well, you'd be paying a one-inch. You'd be paying the same fixed charge as your 5-8. I don't know. So what you'd a have two, to go two to inch pipe or whatever. You'd have to go to a 2-inch pipe. So can, which, I, can I get a 2-inch pipe if I find um, it cheaper? I, I don't know how that works. Um, my sense is your water consumption, Fred, I don't know. I, my I sense have two is, other apartments. They're, okay. up, they're, they're drawing water. So uh, I, That's a good, I do, I do not know. I know we've discussed internally if there's a business that has a historic, like, oversized uh, system and that business has now changed and it's no longer that using the water that we may allow them to retrofit but i'm not sure what are if we would be letting you upsize your your line i'll let jim <laughs> talk about how that would work i guess well that's that's a good question obviously we haven't done any of these yet um i think um, fred could probably you could probably work out the math you'll have to replace you'll have to replace <laughs> I'll, I'll do the math but it just came to mind and it seemed to be an you'll opportunity have to, to ask you guys you'll have to you'll have to you'd have to replace your water service line at your own expense and then once the water line came into your house we have to size the meter based on your usage because the meter as you would understand needs to reflect the amount of water that goes through right. it so you'd have to look at those things and decide whether the break even makes sense for you. But it is possible. Sounds like it might be. Mm -hmm. Yep. But you want to be sure if your consumption yeah, stays the, the same, you know, you, you got to do the math that's even. You know, there may be other businesses or places that might. Yeah. Consider it may pay. If you might really see the benefit about 30 years from now. <laughs> <laughs> that happens with these things. Any other questions from the public? Because I know the counselors have some more questions, and I want we put them off so that. Uh, so that you'd all get a chance and wouldn't have to stay here all night. Wes, you have another one? Yeah, I just I did the number, so I didn't know if you guys wanted to see the, the comparative. I three. thought you weren't good at math. I'm not. <laughs> That's why I need someone to check it. So I don't know. If, Go right ahead. I mean, if you want to. Yeah. Well, if you have six homes that use 16 CCF each, right? It's 16 times 4.73, which brings you to 75.68. 75.68 times six brings you to $454.08. So that'd be if it's on a home basis. If you have an apartment, right, that's service with a larger meter like you're talking about, and it has six units, so it's the same number, and they use 16 CCF each, right? That's 16 times six dollars and nine cents, which brings you to 110.4. So 110.4 times six brings you to six hundred sixty-two dollars and four cents. So the, I mean, the people living in apartments will be paying more for their water. That's just that's just how the math works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I ran it to the computer. I did the scenario that I stated, which was like the four unit versus mm -hmm. the single family home, and it was about eleven dollar difference. Mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. End of the charge per quarter. But then again, if you had four single family homes, you'd be throwing in three extra fixed charges. This is correct. So that's what drives it up. That, that yeah. does. Yes. Yeah. Although the larger line is paying a slightly more incremental line. You're right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yep. Okay. Uh, Councilor DeBarge, you had an, another question or did it get answered? Okay. 
All right, Councillor Adams, I know you had questions. Um, I'm wondering if there's any plan to provide further indirect general fund support from um, the water and sewer enterprise funds as a result of the prop change uh, proposal. Our indirects have been going down steadily over the last several years. Um, uh, you've seen that on our presentations. We've revised our indirect schedule. Um, you know, this year we will see an increase in our health insurance um, just because our health insurance rates are going to go up. So that particular line item would see an increase in terms of the indirect, but that's just a direct, that's a factor of health insurance going up for those employees in the water system. So it's a portion based on that. But in terms of this is only cover, you know, the indirects only cover the indirect costs. And so this would not generate new indirect costs um, because of the revenues going up. Most of these revenues are dedicated towards um, water uh, capital projects. Um, so those would be uh, paid for out of the, out of the water enterprise through the capital plan. Yep. I, I just want to say we've dramatically overhauled the whole um, indirect. Um, we used to do, we used to have like the superintendent and the engineer and do them on indirects. We're now apportioning a portion of their salary right directly to water, sewer, stormwater. So we made that major shift before. So the enterprise funds are truly reflecting the personnel that are working in them. And then, as the mayor said, we've totally revamped how we've done indirects. We've tightened them up. We've made There's them much more the about justifiable. Yeah. Um, and so we've really. We've really made a concerted effort to make those indirects reflective and not um, be seen as some way for the general fund just to make money, because that's mm -hmm. not never been the intent. And I think the new methodology gets us in that direction. Follow up. Uh, I do have a follow-up question. <clears throat> it's about the fire protection fees. Um, the fire protection fees are not based on usage at all. Um, it makes this makes me believe that it's not a a, ta a fee at all, but a tax, which would require council approval. Um, also, the taxpayers are already paying real estate taxes to fund the uh, fire services, so it's like double dipping. And um, to me, it's it's a fixed assessment based on tangible property. It's um, it, it doesn't seem to be a, a user fee to me at all, and it seems to be a tax a tax wrapped inside of a fee. That's that's a that's a statement rather than a question. You could certainly respond. Yeah, I guess the response would be that uh, that a. Um, that a uh, sprinkler system is in lieu of in addition to the fire department. So you're not, you're not paying for the fire. If you don't have a, if you don't have a sprinkler system, you're relying on the, on the system, uh, which is our fire uh, department to come put out the fire. So it's not any way involved with the fire department. These are private systems that are put in by private companies and maintained at the expense of the private owners. It's not a municipal service. Mm -hmm. um, so that's number one. And then number two, I mean, we, we charge fixed fees for all kinds of things, including the fixed fees that we've been charging and will continue to charge the meter fees, which are, again, I just, I just fundamentally disagree that they could be argued as a tax because they're hap they're, it's just it, it's a service provided. It's a service provided. And it's also, um, someone mentioned earlier, it, it is actually a voluntary um, service, which is one of the tests of whether something is an actual service or not. Uh, we have many customers who are on wells. We have many customers who have their own private water supplies. Um, so it actually is not, um, you know, obviously water is mandatory in our lives, but being a municipal water customer or a municipal water su sewer, a sewer customer is not mandatory. You would have to meet other requirements of your water would have to be tested and your mm -hmm. your leach field has to pass title five mm -hmm. five uh ask the realtor um so go ahead uh, Councilor Labarge, you yeah, thank you uh, mayor as an example on west stanton road we have habitat mm -hmm. okay that development could not go up unless that they installed the sprinkler system mm -hmm. because of the flow of water so the city worked very closely with Habitat mm -hmm. and the fire department, because I know I was part of that, to make those apartments happen for that family. Mm -hmm. So it had to be done. Otherwise, it would not be there. So my question is, how do we work that out with 
the apartments or condos of Habitat. Like, I don't know what the fire line size would be for that. It's probably less than two. It's probably a one inch line if it's for serving a residential, so there's not gonna be a fee, a fire fee for them. I'll have to check. I don't know that we would have put a two inch fire, separate two inch fire line for that. Have to check. We could check. I, uh, so it would only be triggered if you had a two inch or larger fire line. We'll just have to check and see what that is. But again, it would be, if it was a 10 inch water line, um, it would basically be $40 a year that would have to be um, absorbed by the condo association. Okay. It would be a $40 charge per year. there's six condos there. Okay, so it would be, t uh, you know, um, $40 divided six ways for a year. Mm -hmm. Councilor Adams, you had another question. I just had a point, which is, uh, I heard the response to Mr. Hardy's point about how we really can't conserve more and get more revenue simultaneously. I, I heard the response, but I, I didn't really hear an answer. I just, I, I don't, I, I still don't agree that those two things can happen easily simultaneously. They just don't seem to happen simultaneously. Do you want to, do you have a, do you have a response to that conundrum? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it does. There, th theoretically, you would have to, you know, if we didn't use as much water, we wouldn't have as much treatment costs and other costs as well. Um, but, but I think, I think, I think their concept and the, the thing they're concerned about is that we're going to develop a water system that needs a certain income level to survive and make it work, mm -hmm. and that if we encourage people to reduce consumption. Yep. Eventually, we're going to have to raise the price of the product mm -hmm. because they're using less of it, but the fixed cost of running the whole system still needs to be fed a certain amount of money. I, I get that concern. That's what they're concerned yep. with is we make people conserve, and then to capture the same amount of revenue, we have to jack the rates up. The question. Thank you for conserving, true. for raising the rate because we have yeah. to feed the beast. I, I totally get that. I totally get that. Yeah. And I, I guess the question That's would true. be. I guess I'd be wondering how much the, how powerful, I mean, we're trying to do some measures, but how powerful will those actually be? Um, how much, how much reduction of, can happen? How much reduction will actually happen? How much, we're trying, but, and we're trying again to mate our, our conservation rates, but if people are paying less than a dollar a day uh, for water in some cases, to service their entire house, um, and, and um, is there going to be a strong enough incentive for them to, uh, you know, start showering as a family or, or you, know, you know, whatever it is, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, switching to gray water. You know, the, a, lot, a lot of people want to do it just as an ethic. They want to live uh, more sustainably. They want to, you know, recycle water. They want to do all that. So I, I guess I would, I would caution you that by having this rate, uh, that we're suddenly going to lose, you know, our consumption is going to drop by 25 percent. Um, again, we think it's a goal. We do think it's a goal that we should have. We shouldn't, you know, if, if we were a for-profit water company, we probably would say, please, use as much water, you know. we got plenty. Use it install all. sprinkler systems, you know, water your lawn every day, you know, do all those things. Um, but we're not a for-profit company. We're, we're also, we also have that municipal... Um, and we're also conserving a resource that is a resource we own. Um, the water's not coming to us from somewhere. It's a resource we own, and we have to preserve and sustain. Councilor Adams, you had a... Sure. To me, it sounds like we want to, you know, it sounds like e the equivalent to saying we want to, you know, lower your taxes and increase services, and that's a wonderful statement and certainly a laudable goal, but just it just doesn't seem reachable. So the, I, I would say that there's really no argument with the point. Um, there's really no argument with the point. Um, it was more valid probably 10 years ago, if you look at some of MWRA's history in the greater Boston area. Um, as a community, we're very efficient in terms of how we use water, and one of the gentlemen that spoke earlier said that the city won an award um, for a number of reasons. One of them is that we were below our target for water usage, so it's likely that we won't see a huge drop in water consumption within the city because of these changes, because a lot of people are conservation-minded as it is. And the other reason it was more important about 10 years ago is all your appliances and fixtures and things in homes now, um, they're a lot more efficient than they used to be. So if you go back 10 or 15 years, um, as people started to make improvements to their home or new, or new structures were built, you know, there was a lot of water saving elements built into um, buildings, businesses, homes, 
and there was a significant drop off in water consumption in some in some uh, systems that that saw that. But in terms of our curve within the city of Northampton, we're already on the downside of of consumption. So whatever we see in this, I don't personally think it's going to have a huge impact on the revenue. But the point is, it's perfectly valid, but I just don't think we're gonna, it's going to so be our that. capacity for reduction, given our current state of affairs, is somewhat limited. We can't, we're not going to get so much better that that's going to be an insurmountable issue. We're not concerned about the revenue, yeah. right. I will only add that if you were at the hearing a year ago, you, there were a number of customers. They were people that lived in your ward. They were people exactly. on fixed incomes. They were people who said they make a conscious effort to try to conserve water. And they, you know, they did say that they felt like th that that those efforts should at least be factored in to um, to this. So this at least offers some modest attempt to try to factor that in. Uh, is it? But again, I think it has to be kept in perspective, as Jim mentioned. Mm -hmm. Other questions from Councilor Labar? You all set? No, I'm all set. Okay. Any members of the public that have a closing question? We've been. We're at two hours and 15 minutes of scintillating television here, and we can keep going if people have more things they want to talk about. But to close, we're we're good. Everyone good yeah. for tonight. One final statement. I, it wasn't. Well, come up so we can hear you because we probably won't hear you back that far. I mean, we talked at the last meeting that there was a limited amount of people here, and that we hoped it would be advertised a little bit better. And in all honesty, I was looking out for it, and I had a hard time knowing that tonight was the night of the meeting, mm -hmm. well. deciphering it out of a a statement in the um, newspaper that wasn't necessarily about this made that tough. And actually, my wife was looking for me. She didn't find it. I reread it. Said, oh, geez, it says right there in the small print there'll be a meeting on Wednesday. Yeah. We did get some new people tonight, but we haven't uh, had an overwhelming turnout. Well, we'll, we'll, I guess we're in a position we can close this hearing. It'll alert the press. The press is here yeah. tonight. They were the last time. Um, we did put social. That's one we, we did do social media. We did, uh, and this is a televised. This is, yes, this one is televised live. You've all been. And I and I the say pleasure being on live that's TV. That's what tonight. I did. The, it's obviously a council hearing. I don't know what yeah. measures the council yeah. took. To no, and we'll, we'll take it back to the whole council. And if the council wants to have yet another hearing, we can do that. Yes, Fred. Just one more thing. Maybe if you turn the lights down a little bit above the screen, we can see it. See it a little better. Oh, I agree. Good. So uh, a motion if we're all set to close the public hearing? I just mentioned so, oh. another thing before you close. Sure. I'm sorry. The, there, were, there were copies of the PowerPoint handed out. Um, Keep it there, were just, there were a couple of typos on one of the tables. It doesn't affect any of the Totals. calculations, but a couple of the CCFs on the, on the business comparison chart. It's been corrected, and it was corrected in the slide, but Pam printed these before we caught the corrections. Mm -hmm. So we will be posting this on our website. Um, it's really, it's just a couple of typos, but it doesn't affect any of the calculations or any of that. Which page is it? Um, it's on the page uh, that is the uh, customer impact uh, business um, compare the comparison that has like Coopers and Faces and Joes and things like that. So there were a couple of just typos, uh, but they weren't actually uh, factored into the calculation. But, but they could pull the correct one off the website. Yes, the new ones on the website, and so it's really just that page that changed. That was the only page that had a correction. Um, it doesn't change the dollar. Amount. It doesn't change the dollar amount. We had a we had a typo on the brewery you see up there has 516 CCF on your slide. It said 2062, <laughs> um, and unfortunately we added the four quarters on that table instead of instead of adding and dividing by four. So that's why it came up with that number. Um, but we've corrected it, and none of the other numbers were tied to it. So it's. It doesn't affect the accuracy of the overall underlying numbers. So, but it will be posted on the website uh, either tonight or first thing tomorrow, so people can get that page corrected. Good. All right. Then, if we're all set, a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion. All in favor? Okay. Thank you all for coming. So, what is what is your about it in council because we can all say it. One more thing. Good. Second. Second. Second.
Okay. So just so we're clear on the lingo here, though, it's going to be a neutral recommendation. Neutral, yeah. Back to City Council. Right, right, right. Neutral recommendation. So because okay. we're going to have an opportunity to discuss this in full council. So we had the hearing. We gathered more information. We're going to send it back with no recommendation is the motion, all right? Yes, ne your neutral recommendation. Neutral, right. neutral, yeah. All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, good. And uh, any new business? No? Then a motion to adjourn. Thank you. Adjourn. Second. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you.